वेलकम वेलकम या हेलो सो वी आर लाइव एंड वी आर अबाउट टू स्टार्ट डॉक्टर सुनीता हेलो हाय हाय बस आप डॉक्टर करेशा हाय सुरेख हैज डन अ वेरी गुड जस्ट अ मिनट मैम जस्ट अ मिनट when she is with the east india she took gokul das she took vice president from east india very nice hello good evening aur hi madam hi hi dr devathi hello 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 hi everyone hello actually i just thought of making this a good program saving maternal lives i thought pasap has to be there then reeti ma'am has to be there and somehow it happened that you know it, it's not actually region wise but we have speakers who really care in that particular uh, uh, topic is theirs and we are live now we are good yes. to go thank you vasish saving maternal lives tackling cricket is our theme for today's webinar A very good afternoon to all the dignitaries. I extend a very warm welcome to the webinar. We are very glad to be associated with the Obstetrics and Gynec Societies of Barpeta, Dibrugar, Guwahati, Jorhat, Nagao, Tejpur, Agartala, uh, Aijwal, Walsad, Guwahati, Tejpur, uh, Kohima, Devi Sangani Obstetrics Gynec Society, and Isopap with them. The convener of this webinar is Dr. Surekha Tade. Dr. Surekha Tade, she is the president of the Delhi Samanya Obstetrics and Gynae Society and president of Vidarbha Chapter of ISOPA. Slide change, please, Mashist. I request all the dignitaries to kindly join for the online inauguration of this webinar. sound clicks Dr. Surekha Tade for her welcome address, and I would like to request her to kindly introduce our guest to the house. Thank you very much, Dr. Rashmi. Live as if you would die tomorrow, and learn as if you're going to live forever. That is what Mahatma Gandhi says. And here we are again, the ISO part with her chapter and the Delhi Sabangi Society, with collaboration with. Number of societies from northeast, which is Barpeta, Dibrugarh, Guwahati, Jorhat, Nagao, Tejpur, Agartala, as well as Kohima, Gangtok, and Valsar. Also, we have uh, from Gujarat. And here we are again with our educational activities. Especially the theme for today is saving maternal lives, which we are finding now that it is. It has been one of the most important topic. and subject for all of us being obstetricians definitely saving maternal lives is what we are here as obstetricians for and that is the key theme of today's session apart from that i would like to inform the house that the isopar with the chapter has been conducting educational activities throughout india and this is our 25th webinar since we have taken from december that is four months we have come uh, conducted 25 webinars across the nations we have gone to kerala we have uh, conducted in uh, two webinars in tamil nadu two in karnataka uh, andhra pradesh telangana and then we have uh, done uh, yesterday only we did with bihar and jharkhand societies 
today we are with North East, and we also did with North uh, with West Bengal, Odisha, Haryana, Punjab. We have done two webinars in Uttar Pradesh. So that is how I think we have to uh, so as to be with all of you, uh, the esteemed faculty from all over the nation, and we have learned ourselves such a lot. And whatever knowledge we could gather. Uh, and uh, uh, our participants have benefited from faculty all across the nation. And thank you very much, uh, our uh, guests for and faculties for being with us for today's uh, webinar. I welcome our chief guest for today's function, Dr. Jaydeep Tang. Then we have our guests of honor, Dr. Sunita Tandulwarkar, then Dr. Gokul Chandra Das. We have Dr. Rosa Ulai with us, our speakers, Dr. Vasak Mukherjee, Dr. Revati Janki Ram. Then we have our chairpersons, Dr. Archana Verma, Dr. Kuresha Ma'am, Naritunath Narit Devgata sir. Then we have Dr. Binit Mishra, uh, Amol Kumar Fukan. Then we have Dr. Arindam Malik. We also have Dr. Charmila Yahu as our moderator of the panel with Dr. Swati Rathor, Dr. Prabhani Kam. Mohanta, then Dr. Bhaskar Sarma, Dr. Jahar Lal Baidya, Dr. Sangeeta Sujayeshri, and Dr. Savita Lal Ghariya as our panelists. And we welcome all of you for this uh, very important session on saving maternal lives. With that, I would like to introduce our chief guest for today's function, none other than our beloved Dr. Uh, Jaydeep Tang, sir. And yes, now I can say very proudly our president-elect, uh, of boxy and really we feel so glad and it is like we we feel like dancing and jumping around when we find that Dr. Jaydeep Tank is now going to lead us and uh, that's what we have been praying and you know we have been so, uh, so all of us are so so happy that now he's uh, the, in the lead and he's the, the president-elect of Foxy and I don't think so that anybody needs any introduction for Jaydeep Tang. And he has been, you know, with all of us throughout the nation since last one year, we have seen him, you know, sharing his knowledge. Dr. Lakshmi Shrikhande, who is the immediate past president and our patron of uh, and with their bicepal, always says is the encyclopedia of uh, obstetrics and gynecology. Any topic, anything, you just ask him and he'll, he'll just guide you. And he's our mentor and he's been there holding our hand. And I don't think I need to really introduce him as the secretary general or anything. And the, the way he has projected Foxy in the, led in the international forums also and the type of projects he has done, the, the way he has brought innovations in Foxy with one of the great innovations is of course the online elections which being conducted I think uh, it's a phenomenal work which he has done. And I think uh, uh, we are so, so glad now that it, he'll be at the helm of SFL soon. So, uh, sir, uh, for your guidance, uh, Dr. Jaydi, we are all ears to your words of wisdom. Thank you very much, Sureka, for those very, very warm, kind, and I must say very, very generous words. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, when Sureka called up and said that I have to attend this webinar, I thought that she was a little hesitant to ask because she said, Abhi election ho gaya, but there is no <laughs> question. <laughs> <of Sureka. laughs> I have known her for so many years and uh, she has always been one of our foremost academicians and research workers and Sureka, I must wish you the very best uh, for your upcoming elections. Uh, thank you also to Rashmi for uh, being the coordinator of this uh, wonderful webinar. I'm not the secretary general anymore, but uh, still I must admit, even now after so much time, when someone says secretary general, I almost half get out of my chair because I've been a secretary general for such a long time. Uh, but when I was secretary general and even now, I think one of my greatest joys has always been when a collaboration happens between our societies. Uh, besides everything that FOXI stands for, it also stands for fellowship and collaboration. And when the collaborations happen across societies, uh, like you have managed to weave together this collaboration, the Isopar Vidhar Society and Devli Savangi leading it along with Barpeta, Dibrugad, Gohati, Jorhat, Nagao, Tespur, Agartala, Aizwal, Kohima, Gangtok and Valsad is, is always so wonderful, uh, you know, to see and, and to hear. 
it is also a great privilege and a pleasure to be uh, sharing a platform with my very dear friend dr sunita tandulwadkar uh, sunita of course uh, has held so many such important positions and i know that whatever sunita does she does in the best possible way and always in the in a way which will attract uh, eyeballs attention and is also academically sound so sunita always a pleasure uh, hearing you and seeing you and of course dr gokul chandra das someone whom we all look up to as mentor uh, in 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 foxy i have worked with sir for several years and it's always been such a pleasure uh, i think your format of uh, the webinar is also excellent two talks followed by a panel i think is always a wonderful way to round up a webinar and you have such great speakers basab my very very dear friend since i don't know how many years now basab uh, and uh, he's also of course the vice president of foxy along with such eminent chair persons archana ji i think who has just joined namaste archana ji namaste sir namaskar dr deokota in fact i think uh, dr kuresha if she is here will remember that we tried to organize yeah, my meeting in valsad twice but somehow it didn't work out so i need to definitely go to valsad and also of course gwalior uh, very uh, as soon as i possibly can and then of course surgical management of pph is going to be covered by dr revti madam again one of our most erudite uh, and scholarly personalities thank you madam it's always such a pleasure to see you and of course uh, for the chair persons in that you have vinit bhai i can see vinit bhai has joined as Hi. always he's good evening on the move and very busy you are uh, with... <laughs> you are far and excellent and dr fukan and dr malik and then you have a panel on a very important topic obstetric collapse being led by none other than charmila and i'm so looking forward to working with charmila uh, in my tenure because i think she will probably be one of the best vice presidents anyone could have and uh, rosa of course always such a pleasure rosa wish you a very happy festival uh, for today i understand it's a very important festival for you and i still remember uh, and have wonderful memories of that wonderful evening you had arranged at the lotus temple uh, in delhi so many years back and of course and the panelists dr swati dr mahanta dr baskar dr baidya dr sangeeta and dr savita i think all of them will impart a lot of knowledge and i'm sure everyone who attends the webinar will be benefited thank you very much again surekha and rashmi for having me over it's always such a pleasure and privilege thank you very much thank you jaydeep sir i think the pleasure and honor is ours and the type of camaraderie you spread amongst uh, everybody who is present i think that is how uh, it leads uh, such a lot of you know uh, that uh, one good feeling we get when we come into any event when you are there so thank you very much uh, dr jaydeep for being there with us and with that i would like to now invite our uh, guest of honor for today none other than dr sunita tandurwalkar as dr jaydeep has said personality is larger than life you know whatever she does she will does do it so best and uh, you you would feel as if you know your eyes as if i said uh, you know you manati manta dipto un takta dore tar so that is how you feel uh, when she does any event or any uh, for that matter not only an event for any small or big program or uh, anything she conducts she will have it to the best and uh, we we are really proud and honored madam uh, uh, by uh, your achievements and we look up to you as a person uh, the, the inspirational personality we always look up to you and we feel uh, like whatever your achievements are we feel that these are our achievements also so madam is the head of department of uh, and chief of the i and endoscopy center and also at dy patel she is the advisor and consultant and uh, uh, she is the founder medical direct director of sono stem cells her extraordinary achievement being india's first stem cell baby and world's first at the age of 45 now apart from that i must tell you that the tenure of uh, smita madam as a president has been extraordinary and phenomenal 
we have all been watching her and must say that she has done even in this pandemic era seven out of the seven big functions uh, conferences six of them have been physical and her uh, must say her installation that itself was in maldives and the type of uh, the work she has been, has done throughout i must say that the, i i can see here Uh, eight books but apart from that in last year itself i think ma'am has uh, 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 all of us have contributed in four more books that she has so so many publication and the research work she has been doing and in the the organizational posts you know in iaga in sr then msr isge so the kind of the leadership she gives to an organization that takes her that organization to really great heights madam has real big vision and that is why uh, she is now here standing as uh, the uh, iconic leader i must say uh, dr sunita and we are all await your uh, words of wisdom for all of us and guidance uh, uh, madam you should unmute yourself please thank you surekha thank you so thank much you. for your generosity in using all the words of appreciation only the great leader can appreciate the other great leaders and that's how i will say surekha i'm looking forward you in foxy because you have a passion to work you want to do something for the organization you want to give your time you want to give your talent you want to educate every foxians in 25 uh, webinars to organize in 4 months i know very recently you took over from uh, i suppose lakshmi as a lakshmi yeah uh, who herself have done a huge work for isoparap and she made it uh, very famous in this part of the country and uh, you entered in her shoes but 25 webinars across the states it shows your passion to be connected with everyone you aptly chosen dr rashmi kahar who is working with you she was so particular in calling up in informing ensuring that i get the uh, Uh, connections the and links so that is very important to select the right people now even the program saving maternal lives because today we are in so much of a stress with this pph what is happening beyond our control losing the lives or getting beaten by the patients uh, it's so it's a burning topic of today and it's very important though there are many webinars are happening every webinar because there are different different faculty they will share their different experiences mm -hmm. you rightly accommodated uh, the vice presidents of the foxy i have dr archana verma whom with whom i was yesterday the most charming lady who works for a public awareness of all and dr basab who is great friend and uh, i know he will be talking beautifully about this topic which you have given it to him dr revati madam you are uh, absolutely the giant speaker in this platform form today and i'm seeing my very dear friend dr vinit mishra after long vinit love you you are like my brother and uh, you are not picking up my phones i want my vinit again back in the action in foxy so lovely to see you vinit my thank very you, dear madam thank, thank you vinit thank you uh, charmila i'm sure the way you are going to take this panel as yesterday it will be fantastic you are speaking hiv on one day and you are speaking on obstetric collapse on another day that shows you are <laughs> your talent and all round personality with it having dr jaydeep tank as a chief guest was such a pleasant let me tell you after his win as a foxy presidency today for the first time we are sharing the platform and it was lovely to see relax jaydeep the winner jaydeep uh i i know even during the election time he was like this smiling cool calm because he knows ki in 6 months no one can work for the presidential candidate it has to be years and years and years from the extreme left side of that chair he has climbed up 
reaching to the center. And I think he deserves this. And let's give a big applause for Dr. Jaydeep Tong. I'm looking forward to learn a lot from Jaydeep. And I'm sure the Foxy will become a most vibrant uh, organization with Shanta. It's already became so high. She faced many challenges from ART bill to the deaths of this suicidal uh, of our own uh, member. But at the same time, Rishikesh Pai, I'm sure he will take it to the different platform and Jaydeep because these people have worked for a Foxy for years together. And I'm sure Rosa, as usual, I have still memories of your adolescent committee, the work you people are doing. And that is why I want Surekha to come in the organization because every member with their academic, with their personality, with everything, there is a lot they can contribute to the organization and the organization goes high on a national and international platform only because of this hard work put in by each and every Foxians, whether they are on chair or they are not on chair. Working towards it is most important. And Vinit, we congratulate you. You became a great director of your organization. I know you are on a very high post. We all are proud of you. You are doing amazing work for entire Gujarat. And I feel every state should have one Vinit Mishra with them. Thank you so much. Sonita, Sonita, Sonita I am seeing a different Sonita today. Anna? I'm safe, Sunita. You are wearing different she, glasses. He does, she does extreme degree of eloquent talking. And I am, and uh, she has oratory in her, you know. She can make, she can make birds cry on the tree, you know. That is what the proverb is. But yeah, she is an excellent orator. My dear friend, excellent. Thank you, uh, Dr. Vineet, sir. I, I just saw Dr. Gokul Das entering. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Good evening. Great Good evening. to see you. Good evening, Sunita. Great to see you. Vineet, bhai, kaise ho? How are you, Vineet? Hey, yeah. Dada, Dada, Ami <laughs> Tomai Balo Bashi. Hey, bhai, Tomai Ko Bhoor Bhaal Lagay. Bhoor Bhoor Bhoorom Karu. You know, this in Bengali, as Basa would say, I just love you. You know, that is what I told you. I think, I think, I think Vineet, you're saying it to too many people, I think. <laughs> Thank you so no, much, no. Dr. Vineet and Dr. Dokul Chandra Das. I can only tell you to Dada, otherwise the other, other beautiful colleagues will kill me. But Dada, <laughs> I really, I really, that is from bottom of my heart. Ami Tomai Balobashi. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vineet, sir. I, I agree with you that Dr. Sunita has the, that charm that she can make. I think the fish also fly and the birds can swim under her uh, guidance. Oh, yes. I think the way you she, are, yeah, yeah, exactly the charm right. she has. Madam so, Sunita, you thank are you very much that. for making this a very lively inaugural. And uh, I, I take this opportunity again to welcome our guest of honor, Dr. Gopal Chandra Das, sir. Can I have a CV like this? But of course, uh, we do not need uh, 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 his, his personality is such that uh, he is a mentor, I think, and he is a friend of everybody. The way he's his uh, personality is everybody feels that yes, he is my own. Even when I speak with him, I feel okay, I'm talking with my own, uh, uh, you know, uh, a mentor. So uh, that is what Dr. Gokul Chandra Das is, professor and head of department for many years at Guwahati Medical College. And he started as the founder of the, uh, the TRIMS uh, OBGYN Medical College the, at Nahar Lagoon. And of course, he's uh, done a lot of work as, as, uh, as OSD at Srimanth uh, Sankara Devi University of Health Sciences, Assam, Vice President of Foxy in 2014. And for years now, he has been leading the, uh, the Northeast Association of OG Society. So, and that's what I think uh, Sir has, Sir is an iconic figure. And of course, uh, uh, organizing various uh, uh, events, the ICOG Guwahati Conference, uh, delivering uh, guest lecture, all that is part and parcel. But what he is, I think he's, everybody recognizes him as a mentor. And that is what, sir, you are for all of us. And we await your words of wisdom. Dr. Gokul Chandra Das, sir, please. Thank you. Thank you sir, so much. Sir, before you say, let me just take one thing to you. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, yes, Jaydeep. How are you? Very well, nice sir. Thank you, Jaydeep. Congratulations once again. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. <laughs>
uh, what I felt looking at these webinars is when I was younger, Diane Fox used to do so many uh, academic activities for the B and C societies. But that time it was very difficult because you have to um, organize finances for getting speakers and sponsors for the meetings and all. But with these um, activities of which the Foxy office bearers have really taught it well, and the organizers are doing that, we can reach to almost all the BNC societies, if not only the A, A societies, and uh, you get the best of best speakers uh, to address the gathering, and we, be, we be, and really we can reach that the actual feeling of the foxes reaching the unreached has really become a, that dream has become a reality with the introduction of this uh, webinar series. And uh, I really wish you all the best and very happy to see all everybody uh, in here. And my regards to my seniors and uh, colleagues, uh, all the best to Sureka for taking so much pain for organizing such beautiful work. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, uh, it is uh, our pleasure and honor, I think, to have so many stars here leading us and guiding us. So that is what how we see it all. And with that, I think we should uh, now be able to start the academic session. I hand over the uh, hand over to Rashmi to take us to the academic session. Thank you very much, all the dignitaries. Thank you, Dr. Surekha, madam. Now let us move towards our academic session. And the first session is a talk by none other than our Vice President Foxy, Dr. Ms. Basab Mukherjee, and he will be talking on medical management of PPH. The respected chairpersons for this session are Dr. Archana Verma, Madam, Dr. Kurisha Kurishi, Madam, and uh, Dr. Ritunath Devpata. I would like to introduce respected chairpersons to the house. Dr. Archana Verma, Madam, basically she needs no introduction, a very loving, cooperative mentor Madam is known for her passion about creating awareness on women's health. Madam is Vice President Foxy and Associate Member of RCOG. She is a founder president of West UP Isopath Chapter and has been organizing chairperson UPCOG 2020. She is a past president in Ghaziabad Obstetrics and Gynae Society and had been organizing secretary North Zone Yuva Foxy 2016 and organizing secretary UP ISA 2015. Madam has many awards to her credit, including India Book of Award winner, President Foxy Best Committee Appreciation Award, UP Governor's Uttarakhand Governor Appreciation Award for menstrual hygiene, and an award from CRPF Director for Health Programs 2019. Welcome you, Madam. Our next chairperson for this session is Dr. Kuresha Kurishi, Madam. Madam is a senior practicing gynecologist. She's hmm? practicing in Padi Valsat for 30 years. Madam is very popular for her clinical skills. She has given a number of infertility awareness and adolescent health awareness programs under the banner of Foxy and has organized many workshops and colposcopic workshops and has given talks to various public forums. We welcome you, Madam. Next slide, please. Our next chairperson is Dr. Uh, Ritunath Devkata, sir. Sir has retired from Sikkim, Sikkim Government Health Services as principal consultant and head of the department. At present, sir is president Ganto Obijwai Society and general secretary, Indian Red Cross Society, Sikkim branch. We welcome you, sir. I would like to hand over the session to our respected chairpersons for further proceedings. Slight change, please. Vashisht. Yes, Archana, ma'am. Welcome, madam, for the session. Uh, very good afternoon, evening, and uh, my uh, salute to all the seniors uh, present here, especially Chief Yes, Dr. Jadeep Tank, and guest of honors, Dr. Sunita Tandalwadkar, the great showman from Fact Foxy, I must say. and. Uh, our Charmila, <laughs> and uh, because it's, I'm so proud, privileged to introduce uh, the most brilliant, most bright star uh, of the uh, Foxy nowadays, Vice President uh, 
from east zone no and favorite of our foxy president and he is a most popular you know and most dynamic mai kya har cheez ke aage na most laga rahi hu to please bear with me most dynamic most decent most learned and boss of the best this is his introduction actually so i, I don't want to say anything else for the dr boss uh, we all know him he is a uh, thank you thank you dr dr archana dr archana chalo let's let's start some studies here thank you abhi and to he is a next aicog uh, organizing secretary also so we will all meet him at uh, calcutta with all the that we definitely will before i start ask him to start the his uh, because he is so much uh, interested to give a talk you know even if a second is wasted his uh, lecture will be uh, like this is there here it will not happen dr basav you can take 10 minutes more and my namaste to uh, all favorite and uh, dr vinit mishra sir aap aa gaye to samajh liye is program mein modi ji aa gaye namaste sir and dr madam 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 archana <laughs> I don't know what is happening. Sunita is so infectious. Archana be excellent. Bol rahi hai, hai na? Party chahiye. Vinit, we all are proud of you. We are. You are a director of your uh, IKD. We are proud wish and we are waiting me, for the party. Me, wish me luck. I am uh, meeting the secretary finance and I am asking him to give me two hundred crores. So he is with F uh, foreign. I mean, he is with finance minister. So I am waiting. So all of you should wish me luck so that I can get two hundred crores for my new hospital. Sir, हमें तो बस आप एक ना party दे दो. दिल्ली में आके मैडम. All the best, Dr. Vinay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Basu. We await your talk. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Doctor Archana. Uh, the problem of being a speaker is that you don't get chance to thank the organizers that well because everybody had a lot of time to thank the organizers. Thank you, Doctor Surika, Doctor Rashmi. Just one point that I want to tell is that um, how much of work Dioli Sangdi and Amravati are doing is if you look in the last five years of Foxy prizes, you will know how outstanding those societies are. And Aishwarya Vidarva, well, uh, wonderful. Twenty-five webinars in five months is absolutely amazing. Over the next uh, next ten to twelve minutes, I'll take you through medical management of PPH. PPH is a topic with which you can speak for not hours, for days. And if you want to look at different aspects of PPH, you can go on for days actually. So what I want to do in medical management of PPH, understanding that the audience is not postgraduates, they are consultants and specialists, is taking some aspects of them and trying to highlight something which may be clinically relevant to our field of management. So one thing we know is that uh, even in the twenty-first century, I am behaving here, man. So. Even in the twenty-first oh, century, please mute mute others. Yeah, but sir, please go ahead. In the twenty-first century, we still have people dying from childbirth, which is actually a shame. Even though we have conquered the moon, we are conquering space. We are doing technological advances, but a very basic dignity in life, especially. when a woman wants to be a mother is something which we unfortunately cannot provide her and of the women who die from childbirth we know still the largest section of that is pph and we will be talking about pph maybe for the next 5 decades will till it finally it will go beyond the normal thing and we'll be talking about something else so in pph i think the important things to understand is the golden hour i think that is where everything starts that graph which is on the top right of your screen is something which is very nice and interesting where there's a first a histogram about where prevention can take place so there's a very important role of prevention of pph we'll just touch upon that and then if you can identify it early about treatment and then if you may not be able to be successful in treatment or you get delayed then it may lead to the death zone or there may be a chance of rescue when you pull them back so what are the determinants that make a woman slip in pph towards death or the things where you can pull them back it depend on different issues some of them which have been come up in 
the confidential inquiries what the name what they used to have before is patient's blood volume so the more the blood volume more the reserve a woman has so especially a woman who is uh, either has a hypertensive disorder then she'll have a low uh, about blood volume or she's low small in stature she'll have a small blood volume then any amount of blood loss would be uh, more uh, significant in the her case a pre delivery hemoglobin we cannot bang in the amount of anemia awareness we are doing it's not working greatly but at the same time it just has to keep on happening especially at the adolescent health level so pre delivery hemoglobin is the big 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 determinant of whether a woman will slip into the death zone during pph or not the next is prevention and early treatment and before the onset of coagulopathy or severe shock so once you are dealing with dic once you are dealing you almost have missed the bus and there's not much you can do at that point of time so uh, of the different things which we talk in pph i think one thing which comes out which is so important is quantitative blood loss in obstetric hemorrhage we know that to 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 treat a particular problem first you need to identify the problem and first you need to understand that yes this bleeding is significant enough for us to take notice of and to intervene and that is sometimes what happens which is which may be delayed so imprecise estimation of actual blood loss is a leading cause of delayed response to hemorrhage so by the time you realize you know ye she is bleeding a lot by that time you may have already uh, lost very vital time and that is something which is important so how do we measure blood loss coming to the same thing so dr sheila mane and a lot of other women who or the, a lot of other experts in pph they do those workshops where they have the different kinds of mops and how much they are wet to find out how much blood loss is we know from our studies that quantification of blood loss is more accurate than visual estimates this is something which we keep on banging in and visual estimates we know underestimate losses when the volumes of are high and over estimate losses when the volumes are low but there is not much of studies to show that the effectiveness of quantitative blood loss on clinical outcomes is not demonstrated so if you do a uh, blood loss detection where you are quantifying it with some visual loss there's not much to suggest that it is going to have a difference in the clinical outcome so when we talk about medical management of pph i think it's something has to be very clear in everybody's mind that there are two sections one is prevention of pph where it's before the actual event happens and that is where most of the intervention actually has a lot of studies have gone and then is the treatment of pph where a woman already has bleeding or has pph so i think that distinction has to be very clear that you know exactly what you are dealing with most of us would be looking at prevention of pph so that it doesn't happen in the first place but then there is another section of treatment so coming to the who recommendations which are the some of the latest uh, uh, evidence which we have picked up for the prevention of pph again now we talk about prevention be very specific about what we talking about so uterotonics in for the prevention of pph here there's a um, there's a there's a list of effective uterotonics for prevention of pph during third stage of labor recommended for all births so there's no question about not giving an ordinary for all births to effectively prevent pph only one of the following uterotonics should be used now that is something i think one i cannot overstress the number of one sometimes we do we use a little bit of oxytocin carbitocin misoprostol everything mixed together and that isn't quite right and that isn't quite logical if you want to really give it so if you're giving carbitocin which a lot of us don't use in our clinical practice that there's not much a point of giving oxytocin because it will the receptors will be blocked already if you're giving carbitocin you really don't need to give misoprostol although a lot of us would uh, are hesitant you may give one but at the same time that doesn't make sense and so who is very clear if you're using for prevention either you give your oxytocin which you used to give we'll come to the dosage in a minute or, or you use your carbitocin the new kid in the block or you give your misoprost but use one the next thing is that if you use oxytocin the roots of oxytocin administration for the prevention of pph after vaginal birth so this is again vaginal birth it's not after cesarean section because there's not so much of data on that but generally we understand we do the same thing at cesarean section use of oxytocin 10 international units intramuscular or iv 
So if it's IV, it's low IV. Otherwise, it's I, I, intramuscular. We will talk to, we will be sharing about the duration of action and uh, how soon it starts acting. But that is something which is basic. And still, WHO uh, goes back that this is your standard care. If you have all the options, this is what you should do. So th this is the WHO recommendations. Again, let's go back to the uterotonics for prevention of PPH. Use of oxytocin 10 un international units, IM or IV is recommended for prevention of PPH for all births. If you're using carbitocin, which is 100 micrograms IM or IV, it is recommended in context where the cost is comparable to other effective uterotonics. So a lot of us in the, in the, in the city are now using carbitocin and we're using it IV, sometimes slow IV. The anesthetist gives it at the, after the delivery of the shoulder. And uh, so that is something which is, which, is well, uh, which is well established and it can be used instead of oxytocin. We'll come to the champion trial in a minute. The use of misoprostol, uh, either 400 or 600 per oral. Huh? This is not the, the rectal administration is what we are often used in or would be were using. But here the WHO recommendations oral is recommended for the prevention of PPH of all births. This is in places where you don't get the other two. So this is in a community setting. This misoprostol may be a, a good option. Ergometrine, methyl ergometrine, again, is in a hypertensive disorder case, no. It, if you have multiple options, it's not your first option to use because of the side effects. The fixed dose oxytocin ergometrine, we keep on mentioning, but we don't have it available, so it's not very good to mention. About your prostodin and the other injectable prostaglandins, we have to understand they're not recommended for the prevention of PPH. They'll, they'll all come into the picture once PPH takes place, but not for prevention. So you don't give a, 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 FG, a, a PG F2 alpha just for the prevention. You give it for the treatment. So this is the so in settings where multiple eutrotonic options are available, like a lot of urban settings, then oxytocin, as we said, is a recommended agent. But oxytocin is unavailable, or there's a problem with the quality, then you go fall back on carbitocin, or if it's cost effective, and the other options which are there. In a, in a setting where a skilled health person is not present for injecting injectable, then you have the oral misoprostol, which can be given, especially in a community level, where still uh, some, uh, some births may be taken in a, at a home or maybe in a setting where you don't have a skilled health person to start an IV line. So here is the thing which all of us know, and this is something I think which is good to understand that oxytocin is given as a continuous infusion when you're giving it IV. It's one of the most time-tested and one of the ones which we fall back on. Methyl argonovin has lost its popularity because of the nausea, vomiting, and the potential to increase uh, blood pressure, especially in a setting of HDP. 15-methyl FG, uh, PGF2 alpha, uh, intramyometrium we don't use, but intramuscular, yes. We know this eight doses, it's often used in, used in quizzes. Asthma is a contraindication of in these cases. But yes, you may, we may have a bronchospasm is one thing. Diarrhea is one thing which you have to be careful. Misoprostol oral is what WHO suggests. Rectal is what a lot of people use because at that time when you're cleaning the vagina you can give it rectally so a lot of people give it rectally and that is something which is okay in small doses but of course increased doses may cause other problems coming a little bit to carbitocin in this regard so again we talk about carbitocin in the setting of prevention of pph and this is the onset of uh, action latent phase one to two minutes and intramuscular if iv given iv it's one to two minutes given intramuscular it's two minutes and duration of action for IV is one hour and IM is 120 minutes. So this is the duration of hours. A lot of people would say, when can I give oxytocin after carbitocin? This logic says that you can't give it after one to two hours because the receptors are blocked after that possibly. But by that time, if a woman has PPH, you would possibly would have started using the other, uh, other uterotonics to control that. So it's not that you'll be waiting for oxytocin, you'll be giving other things at that point of time. Coming a little bit to in this discussion about tranexamic acid in PPH. Now, tranexamic acid came into the picture last around five years ago from the women trial. And the women trial was a part of the, was a fallback on the CRASH-2 trial, where you saw in accident victims that giving um, tranexamic acid a one gram loading dose decreases the amount of blood loss and increases survival. So the women trial, which was done with 20,000 women with established PPH, now we're coming to treatment. Till now we were talking about prevention. Now it's treatment. 
The tranexamic acid 1 gram versus placebo death due to bleeding was 1.5% versus 1.9% in placebo, which was a relative risk of 0.81. And treatment, if initiated within three hours, it was 1.2% death rate versus 1.7 with a relative risk of 0.69 to keep on uh, hindering that you have to give it within three hours. So this was one of the infographics which came out in UK soon after the uh, women trial. The so results from the women trial, the drug could save one third women who would otherwise bleed to death after childbirth. Now that starts sounds very dramatic, but that's what uh, the thing, uh, thing said. Estimated one lakh women die from severe bleeding every year, and that could come down if you can use tranexamic acid. Then the other way of looking at it was here. Immediate treatment has a 70% improvement in survival with every 15 minute delay it decreases by 10%. And after three hours, there's no benefit. So this is crash two women trial, as you said. This was good there. Coming a little bit to the carbitocin, we've touched on it, but uh, we never thought about heat stability and the temperature control that much before carbitocin came into the picture. Oxytocin has been used for a long time. It, was, it had a dark vial, you know, a dark ampule, you remember, which was uh, to uh, prevent the heat and light. We used to keep it in the refrigerator, but we never used to think that whether carbitocin is being uh, is uh, effective or not. But heat stable carbitocin and the very fact that there is something called cold chain, there is something like you have to maintain uh, things at a cold temperature. Otherwise, you may give them, but they may not work and they may be ineffective and they may cause death because you may be giving oxytocin in good interest, but the bleeding is not under control because the, uh, the medicine that you're giving is not effective. So those that entire concept came with carbitocin. Some of it was possibly marketing, some of it was true, but then this is what the carbitocin thing came. And with that, the heat stable, heat labile, the entire concept that you have to be keeping things in cold chain, especially in a context, vaccines we knew that all the time, but in a context of um, uh, postpartum hemorrhage is something which, is, uh, which came up. I'll end the talk with the PPH care bundles. I think it's something to understand because WHO has come up with these care bundles whenever you call whenever you hear bundles you think about bundles of joy and the baby being born but this is something different it's pph care bundles and this is this uh, the original article came in 2019 so basically a group of uh, technical experts uh, in who got together and they got together and they looked at different interventions which are there for PPH and try to club them into some groups to make sure that you uh, remember to do all of them together and don't forget them. So that's putting it very simply. And this is a description of the WHO recommended clinical interventions for PPH 2012 to 17. So uterotonics, of course, we discussed today. That's all those uterotonics, controlled cord traction, postpartum abdominal uterine tonus assessment, where you actually massaging. Here, the massaging is there, but you first assess and then you massage. Then tranexamic acid as a treatment, isotonic crystalloids that all of us give. Then the intrauterine balloon tamponade, which will be possibly the second line. We'll come to that in a minute. The compression can, besides being a massage, you can do a bimanual uterine compression, one hand inside, one hand outside. Then the external aortic compression, NASG, and then the antibiotics in the context of placental retention, not just because it's PPH, uh, uterine artery embolization and surgical interventions, which will, Dr. Devati will be covering. So this is the first response PPH bundle. So this is what they have said, uterotonic drugs, which you need to give. We've had a list of that in this presentation earlier. Isotonic crystalloids, tranexamic acid. I, I highlighted the trial of the women trial, which now has stamped um, tranexamic acid in the setting of treatment of PPH. Now, there are a lot of trials going on of tranexamic acid in the setting of prevention of PPH or prevention of things, and there is uh, very favorable results. But we haven't got it into recommendations and guidelines yet. So tranexamic acid is still uh, for the treatment of PPH, but of course, in the prevention, we are using it uh, extensively, and we'll still have to wait for the more, uh, more evidence based on that. Uterine massage, there's nothing, no problem. So initial fluid resuscitation is done with IV administration of uterine tonics. If IV is not available, then fluid resuscitation with sublingual misoprostol, parental uterotonics, intramuscular, and all those things. But usually you'll have a good IV line because otherwise you can't give fluids. But this is your first response PPH bundle. And if this doesn't work, then you get your compression measures. Either you press the iota, where there's less blood, or you press the bimer.
primarily to end compression where you control the bleeding till you get more help. Intrauterine balloon tamponade is there. We haven't got the suction uh, machine, the suction uh, component. So we know uh, from South, uh, Dr. Panikar and Dr. Samartha Ram, they are the comp proponents of the suction device where the two walls get uh, 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 got sucked and uh, press against each other. Again, the same way, tamponade in the reverse direction. So there were some a lot of papers, a lot of publication in that regard, but it hasn't come as a WHO guideline yet. So it's still the tamponade or the pressing the wall from inside outwards. So a non-pneumatic anti-shock garment, that's again um, uh, pretty in the north, and I think Dr. Sheila in the south are doing some work in PPH with their NASG things. Uh, continuing dose of uterotonics, oxytocin diluted in things, and the second dose of tranex message should be administered in the in this model. So whenever they have nice workshops on PPH, in fact, in the ICOG, let's have a standalone uh, workshop on P PPH oh, alone throughout yeah. AICOG, or maybe at a continue, maybe a fixed uh, component of AICOG PPH workshops till we eradicate PPH. So just uh, implementing this, uh, so just finally, the uh, final slides, implementing this approach to addressing PPH requires facility readiness, supply chain, improvement, teamwork, and communication network integration, and local uh, data for troubleshooting. And this was coming from FIGO. And thus, takeaway, PPH remains the major killer in the 21st century. Pre-delivery hemoglobin buildup prevention. So pre-delivery pre hemoglobin buildup may also use IV iron in the antenatal period. I think that's something which we are underusing. Possibly we may need to overuse to back up so that we don't have, so PPH doesn't kill. Prevention of PPH, I think we still are, do, we are doing it fairly good, regularly in the urban setting, but not in every setting because a lot of things happen in the rural area or the not so fortunate areas. Early recognition score, um, early recognition, so important. Again, we uh, highlighted a point on the visual estimate being poor and uh, quantitative being better, but not exactly sure that which method is the best that hasn't been yet justified. And it scores over anticipating PPH on risk. I think when we are postgraduates, we used to say risk factors of PPH over distended uterus, long labor, short labor, and all those things. I think that's slowly phasing off. And this is what you really want to do. To so, this is the entire idea. Savita of the, ji, please yeah. mute. Training of HCPs or healthcare providers in labor ward across categories. So the consultant, the nurse, everybody has to be trained to make sure it works like clockwork when actually the problem happens. Increased blood and blood product availability, easy to say, difficult to do, possibly the most difficult of this entire set of things which need to be done. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Surekha. And, uh, yeah, fine. thank you, Dr. Basab. I think that was wonderful. And uh, a lot of take-homes are... And one of the things which you said that you have to have that systematic approach and the drill, you know, to just, it should come one after the other, the way you have defined it and the PPH care bundle. I would like to inform the house, Dr. Basab, uh, that uh, the PPH care bundle project uh, uh, from WHO in 2018, it was discussed in our medical college that is uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the MGIMS Seva Gram uh, with Thomas Burke and Jerker, uh, uh, Dr. Jerker, who is the chair of the um, WHO PPH bundle care project there. He, the, both of them were with us and we did that project for two years. And after that, I think all the guidelines with Dr. Poonam Verma from our medical college, the head of department also. And we also did the vertical integration project. I mean, uh, it was defined that uh, uh, all the medical colleges has to be integrated vertically with the periphery so that you know there is a channel for referral of these patients so that's what these are the two projects i just wanted to bring it up so that uh, we can really focus that yes the pph bundle care approach is the one which we should be going ahead with so with that i think dr kuresha is there we want your comments madam uh, uh, dr savita couldn't be there uh, dr archana had to leave kuresha ma'am your comments please on dr basu yes yes Sir, very good and very informative lecture we had. I want to know how we can do the PPH drill and as well as how can we sensitize our staff about PPH. And we usually organize eclampsia drill. We usually organize our fire drill. But I want to organize this PPH drill. Now I will probably start after this lecture. We must organize this drill to improve our... 
maternal mortality rate. Thank you very much for giving me this chance. And it is very, it was very, very informative lecture. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Prasha. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank sir. you, madam. Dr. Rosa, madam's opinion, please. Well, I was really enjoying Dr. Basap's uh, very detailed to the point. Script. Basap, congratulations. I'm very happy that you mentioned about carbitocin. And so beautifully, you mentioned that it has to be given once a baby is out. Because many a times we make a mistake of using it just like oxytocin when the anterior shoulder is out. So it's a whole baby out and then we give it. And there is no problem with the retention of placenta. So beautifully you mentioned, as always, charming to the point. Thank you so much, Basta. Well spoken. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Basta and all the chairpersons with good take-home messages for the participants. We'd like to move ahead with our session uh, and then we move uh, to the session number two. Dr. Rashmi Kahar, please take over. Rashmi? Yes. yes. Slide change, please. Yes. So our next session is on surgical management of PPH. And the speaker for this session is Dr. Respected Dr. Revti Jankiram, madam. We welcome you, madam. The respected chairpersons for this session are respected Dr. Vidish Mishra, sir, Dr. Arindam Malik, and Dr. Amal Kumar. I would like to introduce our respected chairpersons to this session. Dr. Vinit Mishra needs no introduction. It's a great honor and pride that he has agreed to come to our webinar. The he is the director, as we all know, he's the director of Institute of Kidney Disease and Research Center, Andamar. And we read a lot about this oh, institute wow. and get inspired. We yeah, read it yeah. about it on the net and the website. Sir has been chairperson of Urogynic Committee of Foxy, organizing chairperson of International Urogynecological Conference, Urogyne 2030, founder member of this, that is Gynecological Endocrine Society of India. And uh, he has received research awards uh, to postgraduate thesis and uh, Himself, he has received 23 research awards. We welcome him to the webinar, sir. Our next chairperson is Dr. Amal Kumar Kupan, sir. Sir, is senior consultant, OBGYN, and he has been past general secretary, Johar Society of OBGYN, and he is a trained laparoscopic surgeon. We welcome you, sir. Next chairperson for this session is Dr. Arindam Malik, sir is OBGYN consultant and at present he is secretary of Agartala OBGYN Society. We welcome you, sir. I would like to hand over the session to respected chairpersons. Slide change, please. Dr. Vinit, sir, please. Dr. Vinit, unmute yourself. Yes, sir, you're on mute. Yeah, thank yes, you. Yes, thank you, Madam Sureka. And uh, we have Rashmi, Madam. This is, this is an excellent effort. And as usual, Sureka, Madam, is, is par excellent. I have uh, Madam Janki Raman, Revdi Janki Raman. She was my she was my colleague as Vice President Foxy. Excellent human being. Let me tell you, her husband is still better than her. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Very down to the earth person. But it has been an excellent association for so many years. And I would definitely like to tell you that whatever she delivers, she will deliver excellent. Thank you. Yes, Rashmi? Yes, slide please. Can I share my screen? Assist, slide change please. We need Dr. Janki Raman's slide. Vashish. Yes, ma'am. Dr. Ravti's slide, please. Ravti, madam, slide, please. Yes, I would yes, like to say a me. few words about respected Dr. Ravti, madam. Madam, 
is professor and uh, she is the former director IOG Chennai and has been vice president Fox South since 2016. And she, at present, she is vice president Tamil Nadu Federation of Obstetrics and Gynecologists. She is the founder secretary and past president Madurai OBGY Society and president IMS Madurai Chapter, president Madurai Chapter of Tapisa, recipient of Fox of the Durusha Community Services Award and recipient of Lifetime Achievement Award, IMA Madurai. She has been selected as master trainer for PPI UCD program by Figo Foxy and author of Foxy Focus on Amniotic Fluid A to Z. She has contributed many chapters in undergraduate and postgraduate groups, and she has won the Pride of Foxy Award in November 2019. It's a great honor to welcome you, Madam. We welcome you to the webinar and request you to kindly start your talk. Thank you. Welcome, ma'am. Please share screen now. Thank you, Dr. Rashmi, for your kind introduction. Good evening, all. It was my great pleasure and privilege to be with Professor Christopher Lynch in the workshop on PPH management at Bangalore, which was organized by Safe Motherhood Committee. We talk about PPH postpartum hemorrhage. Now, how are we going to manage that? The same way, PPH. You have to predict, prevent, and handle swiftly. That is very, very important. Because 1 to 5% of all deliveries end up in PPH. Of that, 25% of maternal deaths are because of PPH. 90% of the deaths occur within the first two hours. That is very, very important point to note. Therefore, Swift action is mandatory. Now, remember, we've got a lot of medications like uh, Vasa was telling about this uh, medical management, and all those things, AMTSL and all. We are trying a lot to prevent the PPH and treat the PPH. But remember one thing, PPH may not be totally 100% preventable, but death due to PPH must be prevented and there should not be any death because of PPH and it is only in our hands. So how are we going to do that? You know the etiology four T's, the tone, trauma, tissues like uterine atony, laceration, rupture uterus, inversion, retained tissues and all those things require surgical intervention. Of course, thrombin coagulopathy, not much of a surgical intervention. Still, you can control bleeding with the surgical measures. I tell you, I start with a case scenario which I recently heard. One trainee was delivered an average size baby after a medial lateral episiotomy and the doctor left asking the junior to suture the episiotomy and she left. Exactly within an hour, she was called back as the patient fainted while getting up to go to restroom. Pulse query, BP query and she was very pale. And because the doctor was stuck up in government hospital, she asked me to just to go and see the case. And when I asked the junior doctor, I said, it is firm and contracted, there is no anti-vaginal bleeding, nothing, madam, oh, but the patient has collapsed. But when I went and examined, of course, the uterus was uh, tense and it was well contracted. But local examination, when I was expecting to see uh, excessive vaginal bleeding, but there was a huge vulval hematoma, which has to be evacuated under GA and he has to be given transfusion also. A simple measure of properly taking care to suture an episiotomy, when it was not done, properly, it has resulted in severe PPH leading on to maternal morbidity. So that is why I always I teach my PGs, within that first hour, you don't leave the patient at go, just while you're writing the case sheet and looking after the baby and writing the notes and all those things, you look at the patient right from head to foot, say starting from the head, look for anemia, pulse rate, blood pressure, frontal height, any abdominal distension, any mass, undue vaginal bleeding, fresh bleeding, vulval swelling, episiotomy swelling, all these things should be flashed in your mind so that you look for it right from head to foot. And more specifically, when there is a bleeding, you specifically look for traumatic causes, look from perineum to fundus. Perineal lacerations, vaginal lacerations, cervical lacerations, clitoral tear, rupture uterus, broad ligament hematoma, all these things to you keep in your mind and look for it. And of course, retin placenta can also be a cause for a PPH. Now, when you are searching for trauma, there should be good lighting, good analgesia, good assistance. All these three are very, very important. Failure of even one can lead on to missing the diagnosis. Okay. Two large stem speculum, 
four sponge holders, four inch ribbon, rubber, ribbon gauze, large pack must be available. When medical as well as mechanical methods fail to control bleeding, quickly switch over to the surgical method, which can be either be a conservative method or a non-conservative method. The key factor in the surgical management of QPH is awareness of the predisposing factors, the readiness of the therapeutic teams consisting of obstetric, anesthetic, and hematology staff. Now, you have to anticipate PPH, not only in the high-risk patients. Pregnancy per se is a risk for PPH. Remember that. So, you have to anticipate PPH in all, more in some cases with high-risk factors. The surgical methods that are available are compression sutures, uterine artery ligations, step-based devascularization, internal iliac artery ligation, suction cannula, and hysterectomy. Test for the potential efficacy of bleeding suture before the procedure by bimanual compression. If the bleeding stops, there is a good chance that application of bleeding suture will work and stop the bleeding. Hemostatic suturing technique as a second line strategy, the first line is of course medical, as a second line strategy for control of uterine bleeding due to uterine hiatony is an effortless, fast and conservative surgical procedure. It can be performed satisfactorily both after cesarean as well as after vaginal delivery. Complications related to its application have been identified, but so far no death because of this. And complications may be like uterine cyanic, ischemia, uterine necrosis, intrauterine infection, and strangulation of intestinal loop and abdominal momentum. More recently, uterine compression switches have also been indicated as a prophylaxis for acute recurrence of uterine inversion. Of course, all of us know about this B-Lynch procedure, taking the bite. Uh, 3 centimeters medially and 3 centimeters below the lower ridge and taking it again up 3 centimeters above the upper ridge and then bringing it round the fundus and taking again this at the same level posteriorly and again bringing it back anteriorly and tying it together. This is a very simple procedure devised by Professor Christopher B. Lynch. And of course, this is how it looks like after suturing. Now, remember two things. Throughout the procedure, the assistant should continue to compress the uterus. Number two is that you have to watch for the control of bleeding vaginally. It is very important whether your procedure is successful or not, or we have to go for the next step. And of course, the suture material previously we used to do with the chromic cat Now, you can use one by three, 70 mm half circle needle, 90 centimeter length. Now, there are a lot of advantages of bleeding suturing because it's simple, life-saving potential, relative safety, and its capacity to preserve fertility. Now, satisfactory hemostasis can be assessed immediately after the application. Suppose if it fails, you can just switch over to the more radical surgical methods then and there. So you are minimizing the time to switch over from one procedure to the other procedure. And it has been successfully applied with no problems to date without any complications also. The positioning is, of course, under anesthesia and bladder is catheterized and the patient is placed in Lloyd Davis position. What is that? Trendlenburg position with legs apart or head down lithotomy. It is defined as supine position of the body with the hips flexed at 15 degree as the basic angle and with a 30 degree head down tilt. Now, this is very important because simultaneously you can look at the uh, bleeding arrest or not. Now, good assistant is very, very essential. Now, a stitch in time saves nine. Now, the following B. Lynch procedure, a lot of modifications have been done. Caymans, Pereira, Cho stitch, and uterine sandwich technique, combining the Heyman and external compression along with intrauterine bakery balloon tamponade also. So, all this permutation combination of this compression switches aim at compressing the uterus, making it to contract and retract as physiologically as possible so that the bleeding gets arrested. Now, when we are mentioning all these varieties of compression switches, which is the best and which is unique and which one you have to choose? Now, so far, no studies and they don't see any significant difference between the variety of switches. But there was one study by Velacius and all. He showed some interesting data that uterine compression suture efficacy varies according to the area and the cause of uterine bleeding. There are two sectors. The uterine body is the sector one and the cervix and upper vagina is sector two. So, the sector one bleeding, Beelins, Heyman, and Cho, Prayer, all these things achieve similar success. Whereas in the lower part, cervix and upper vagina bleeding, Cho seems to be better because the compression switches are coming in that area also. And another point noted was that KM et al. in 2011 showed that when there is a delay of two to six hours between delivery 
and the uterine compression suture it is associated with a four fold increase in the risk of failure so remember that this is a simple procedure compression suture but do it quickly if you do not do it within the 2 to 6 hours again the chance of failure is more next we go for bilateral uterine artery ligature the first case of bilateral uterine artery ligature was published by Waters in 1952 and later on by O'Leary in 1966. It's easy, fast and safe. 90% of the blood supply to the uterus is from uterine artery. So it is a successful procedure for controlling the bleeding from the uterine body. But it is not effective as I told you earlier, if there is a bleeding from the sector 2, that is lower uterine segment and the cervix or paracolpose. The main complication which everyone is fearing about this uterine artery ligation is that injury to the ureters. But of course, it is very rare. It is only related to a technical mistake of placing the sutures too low or not mobilizing the bladder properly. And remember, this BUAL does not seem to interfere with the menstrual function or the future reproductive uh, capacity of the patient. Now, I just show you a small uh, video clipping. And now, what I do is to my postgraduates, I teach them the uterine artery ligation. When I do the normal cesarean section, on one side, I train them to do the uterine artery ligation. So it is not going to do any harm to the patient, but the PGs learn that so that when they go outside and practice, they can do this uterine artery ligation in need when there is a atonic PPH. It's a very, very simple procedure with 90% success. Now, this is how you do that. In the model, you see the uterine artery close to the uterus. Of course, the bladder is already mobilized, so the chance of ureter, ureter is not there. Simultaneous uterine massage also there. And in the broad ligament, you palpate the uterine artery. Of course, close to the uterine wall. And it's unlikely that you injure the uterine vessel or the ureter because you are going to take a bite only through the uterine musculature like this. Three centimeters medially, you take a bite in the uterine musculature, bring it posteriorly, take out the needle, and the, this is bite in the uterine musculature, and the bite back again is through the broad ligament EA vascular area. It is a very, very simple procedure. That's all. You just try that. This simple procedure in teaching institution, all PGs must be taught. Similarly, on the other side also, you do that and come away. And of course, the next step is stepwise devascularization. Obviously, our ultimate aim is the uterus not to bleed. So if you cut off all the blood supply, it is, there is a chance that the bleeding will stop. So you can start from the lower uterine, upper uterine, and then the ovarian artery. So stepwise, all unilateral, bilateral. So all those areas, you can occlude the vessels. And most important thing is internal iliac artery ligation. Now, it is effective method to control intractable PPH and prevent maternal mortality. For not only for uterine atony, but also for uterine rupture, placenta previa, placental abruption, placenta increta, and broadly hematoma. This internal iliac artery ligation is going to do a lot to prevent the maternal mortality. Now, it was first performed by Kelly in 1894 and with a success rate of 40 to 100 percent, it reduces the pelvic blood flow by half and pulse pressure by 85 percent, thereby simulating the venous rather than the arterial circulation. Although this technique provides a rapid and effective way to control hemorrhage, it is not at all used commonly. It is very much underused. You know why? Because of fear of injury to the surrounding structures and training is not proper for the person to who are doing it and also the fear of injuring the ureters. Now, internal iliac artery ligation may avoid the need for hysterectomy in the context of uterine atony. So, everyone should learn this procedure also. Now, in addition to cases of traumatic PPH and uterine rupture and extensive genital injuries, internal iliac artery ligation clears the operative field and facilitates the hysterectomy part. Now, during the procedure, the common iliac artery is identified. After dissection, those who are done, uh, Worthiams definitely know this procedure easily. But of course, you have to get them trained while they're doing hysterectomy for any other condition. Make them understand the anatomy of the internal iliac artery. Just show them. Okay. The common iliac artery branches into an internal iliac, 
causing medially and inferiorly and externally causing laterally and superiorly. It is noteworthy that even after bilateral internal aortic ligation, the vascular supply to the pelvis is not completely compromised. And obstetricians ought to be more familiar with this procedure as it is an effective and rapid way to control PPH. Now, I just simply show you the procedure. Accessing the retroperitoneal space is just by cutting through the over the peritoneum over the round ligament. Of course, you can use the unipolar or bipolar cautery to make the field clear. Open up the peritoneum, reach the retroperitoneal area. Use the retractors and identify the ureters. That is ureter. That is very, very important. Now, again, ureter identification, remember, not just by palpating it. You have to see the peristalsis. That is very, very important. And keep it aside medially with the, under the retractor. Now, in between the two retractors, you can easily identify the common iliac and the branching into internal and external iliac. And most important thing is that after identifying the in, uh, common iliac artery, internal and external iliac artery, it should be ligated farther away. That is at least 5 cm to 5 cm distal to the bifurcation. That is the area where you have to ligate it so that you can avoid injury unnecessarily to the external iliac vessels. And always the thing will be from lateral to medial, not from medial to lateral because medial to lateral, chances of injuring the veins is more. Now, the L-clamp is introduced beneath the artery using the L-clamp from lateral to medial. Gentle handling, avoiding injury to the veins, are the most important points we have to note at the time of internal iliac artery ligation. Okay. Of course, after suturing, you have to check the external iliac artery pulsation or the femoral pulsation. Okay, make sure that you have done it correctly. Make sure of the that you are not injured the ureters. Okay. Single or double knot you can put either unilateral or bilateral. Figo recommends internal iliac ligation as one of the options to rapidly control PPH for management of PPH when medical non-surgical approaches as well as compression sutures. Fail. So, after step wise, you are doing everything. All these things, when failed, you go for an internal iliac artery ligation. Figo also recommends that all obstetricians familiarize themselves with the internal iliac artery location as well as the technique of its ligation. That is again very, very important. Okay, we know all these things simpler techniques like massage, uterotonic drugs, uterine packing, balloon tamponade, all these things can be practiced, practiced in low research settings also. Whereas surgical techniques like b lean stepwise devascularization, internal iliac artery ligation, uterine artery embolization, all these things are available only at higher centers. Now, these facilities are not within the reach of every parturient woman when simple techniques fail. So what are we going to do? The golden hour is very, very important because it is the one aiming at reducing the morbidity and mortality related to the delayed management of PPH. 
Now, there is a direct relationship between the time taken to control the bleeding and a poor maternal outcome. Now, when you delay controlling the bleeding, that will result in lethal triad of hypovolemic shock, coagulopathy, hypothermia, and acidosis. Once these things set in, it is very difficult to revert back the patient to normal and whatever you are going to resuscitate is going to be unsuccessful. So we can divide a golden hour into three periods of 20 minutes. First 20 minutes mainly represents medical treatment, fluid replacement, identification management of the main cause of bleeding, the all four T's. The next 20 minutes involves performing mechanical maneuvers, intrauterine tamponade, surgical procedures, compressive sutures, and pelvic vascular ligatures. So 20 plus 20, in spite of all these things, if it is not getting control, the remaining 20 minutes are for non-conservative surgical techniques, which include hysterectomy and also damage control surgery. Now, within that first golden hour, you have to identify and manage it. Only then you can save the patient. Now, there are three cornerstones for conservative surgical procedures, simplicity, safety, and efficacy. Suction cannula, followed by maintenance of negative pressure in the uterine cavity by keeping the cannula inside for 20 to 30 minutes is a simple, safe, highly effective and conservative surgical method to control PPH in low resource settings. I'll tell you how it is going to help a lot. Creating negative pressure inside the uterine cavity with a specially designed cannula results in shrinking of the uterus, which can assist the natural physiological process of contraction and retraction to stop the atonic PPH. Now, the cannulae are like this, measuring 25 centimeter long, 12 to 24 millimeter diameter. Uterine portion measures 14 centimeter long and vaginal portion 10 centimeter. And uterine portion, that diameter is a little more, 24 mm and 18 mm, and vaginal portion 12 mm in diameter. Now, the outer portion is, is the nipple of the cannula to be connected to the suction machine. Perforations are present in the fundal portion and the cervical portion, not in the vaginal portion. Okay, the thick wall, not easily collapsible, flexible plastic suction tube is to be used, of course, with high vacuum suction vision or vacuum suction pump, which can produce a negative pressure of up to 650 millimeters of mercury within one minute. Now, how, this is how you do that. Now, as you can see here, when you introduce the cannula and you create negative pressure, the soft cervical tissues around the cervical portion of the cannula get sucked in to the perforations of the cannula. So, the uterus get closed. Now, whatever is collected in the cavity is being sucked in. Ultimately, the uterine lining is also coming into contact with the cannula. So, everything becomes contracted. Now, you might have experience where you are using the MR cannula for MTP or a suction cannula for uh, uh, MTPs or evacuation of mole. You might have seen that the procedure is shorter, the bleeding is less, and the uterus also contracts and retracts so quickly. The same principle here also. So, that once you make the uterus empty, then automatically the uterus will contract and uh, very quickly. And when atonic bleeding does not stop by all routine medical measures, they should be kept in lithotomy position, catheterized, blood clots to be removed, introduce the catheter. I'll just show you the video also. Now you have to clean that area, see the patient bleeding more, Put in a specula. Now she is bleeding profusely. Simultaneously, you have to keep your hand on the uh, left hand on the uterus fundus and give the massaging also. And with the right hand, you introduce the cannula. Okay? So you put in the speculum, visualize the cervix, hold the anterior lip of the cervix with a sponge holder. Introduce the cannula. Of course, you're going to connect it with the flexible tubing also already and connect to the suction apparatus. So, with the right hand, you hold the cannula, with the left hand, feel the fundus, and the cannula tip should go up to the fundus and start the vacuum creating up to 600, 650 millimeters of mercury. So hold it for some time till the uterus gets contracted and the cannula is in situ. Okay. Now the cannula should be kept in position as long as the threat for recurrence of bleeding is expected. Even up to 24 hours it can be kept. 
And after the procedure, when we try to pull the cannula, it will not come out easily because the cervix is stuck with the cannula. So what you should do is, you just remove the negative pressure and dismantle it from the vacuum apparatus. And then you introduce your fingers and with the fingers, you just release the cannula from the cervix. It will become easier. And once the cervix is released, automatically you can remove the cannula easily. This simple and cost-effective technique takes very little time to organize and can stop bleeding within three minutes in atonic PPH. Now, even in case of cesarean section, we can use it. What you can do is this, like this. So, this is a case of covalent uterus with the PPH. So, you introduce the cannula. Now, you keep the tubing also attached and the tubing you just introduce through the service and allow it to bring out through the vagina. Uh, so that it can be connected to the suction apparatus and the cannula you keep it inside the fundus and you close the incision and start the negative pressure. Completely the uterus will be evacuated and the bleeding will stop, uterus will get contracted, then you can suture the, uh, suture the wound also and you can keep the cannula for some time. Subsequently, once the bleeding completely stops, you can remove that. So, one end of the suction tube should be connected to the cannula. The other end should be inserted through the uterine wound and brought outside the vagina. And the outer end of the suction tube should be connected to the suction machine. And after keeping the cannula in proper position and after keeping the cut edges of the wound close together, negative pressure should be applied. Uterine wound should be closed when negative pressure starts working. That is the important thing. Now, the important point I would like to say that is that uh, I'm proud to say that Tamil Nadu health system is working very well, especially in preventing maternal mortality and especially in preventing PPH in the mine in our district, Madhuri district in 2022, right from Jan 22, there is no maternal death till date and no death due to PPH. That is a very, very important thing. And the reason is that I just inquired in the department how much of billions, how much of internal agar delegation they are doing, but right as we were used to do years ago nearly 1 or 2 billions daily and nearly 20-30 internal cartilagation in a year. But she said nowadays that is very much minimized because of the use of two things. One is AMTSL, second is the suction cannula. Now, this for the suction cannula, Dr. Bailey has come and given training and he has conducted a workshop and he has given training to many of the uh, headquarters hospital doctors and government has sanctioned fund for buying this cannula also in the headquarters hospital and even ANMs are going to be trained in that uh, as in Kerala and definitely both combined will definitely bring down the mortality, uh, I can't say even bring down, it will make the mortality due to PPH nil. And the last result, uh, surgical measure is hysterectomy. FICO recommends abdominal hysterectomy as treatment for PPH when all other medical, non-surgical and surgical treatment modalities fail. Care must be taken to have adequate blood supplies. Subtotal hysterectomy can shorten the procedure. And of course, placental pathology like abnormal presentation, present previa, abruption, atony, uterine rupture, for all these things, you have to go for a hysterectomy. But remember, this should not be as a last result. It should be considered as soon as it is apparent that bleeding may pose a threat to life. So the taking decision to do hysterectomy is the most important thing, correct time, the decision must be taken. Remember, the uterine and ovarian vessels are enlarged and pelvic tissues are edematous and friable and you have to avoid injuring the ureters. Clamp cut, clamp cut, that procedure and suturing later will save time and minimize bleeding also. So, to conclude, every obstetrician must have a basic training on compression sutures, uterine artery ligation, internal iliac artery ligation and SR cannula use section retraction cannula use. And next year, I am the president of TNOFG, Tamil Nadu Federation of OG, and our theme is reduction of maternal mortality and cancer service free India. In Tamil, we say, Magachiana Magapere, Maranamilla Magapere, Putuno Illa Magali Nalam, Punaga Indra Magali Rudan. We don't want any woman die because of pregnancy and we want every woman to be happy without the fear of cancer, especially cancer service. Thank you very much. Absolutely wonderful, madam. And I think uh, all inspiring lecture it was, the way you have gone through your, and, and, and the command you have to take on the subject. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Minute, sir. Yeah, madam, excellent lecture. And as usual, 
you are you are always excellent in academics thank, thank you, you for your excellent presentation madam thank you thank you dr amal kumar mukan sir is there as the chairperson so we invite your comment sir sir please unmute yourself dr amal kumar mukan madam i must say the video is uh, very beautiful yes. dr mukan sir he is there yes. yes i must say it was an excellent presentation and uh, i have learned about this acer canola we have never used acer canola yet in assam uh, oh. how can i get this acer canola here in assam yes uh, it is available in the market but anyway i can ask dr Sam samataram to contact you yeah. or i can sir i should number. send you the phone, phone number. number yeah, yeah. phone number yeah yeah, sure. yeah okay 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 we'll share your phone number and uh, i must say that we have learned a lot and i hope that all pg students and other uh delegates also have benefited from your lecture thank you so much thank you thank absolutely you absolutely wonderful madam i must say uh, it was treat for all of us and uh, to watch all the videos to go you know the way you have taken us through as if it was like we are just uh, ourselves managing the case of ppage and i think it's lots to learn from you and hats off to your uh, oratory skill and your command ma'am thank you so much for being there thank you the chairpersons dr vinit mishra dr amal kumar pukan and dr arindam malik who has joined here and uh, with that uh, i thank all thank the faculty and we move to the panel thank you thank you, thank you thank madam you. for in thank you for inviting us and giving us that opportunity and thank this you. has been a platform where i could see and meet lot of my old friends and memories were refreshed thank you surekha madam thank you very much thank you sir thank you surekha and savita so let us move towards a very interesting panel discussion on oxytic collapse and the moderator for this panel is a very near and dear friend of ours dr shamna abel man and the expert for this panel discussion is none other than past vice president oxy Dr. Rosa Olaimat. I would like to introduce the moderator, the expert, and the panelists to the house. Next slide, please. Dr. Shamila Vyar, Madam, is has been chairperson, clinical research committee, Foxy, 2016 to 18, and she is ICU governing council member. She is a national coordinator, UNICEF Foxy PCA, and national coordinator, Meta Foxy PG program. She is WHO CRO MBSR India member, 2021, and has been past secretary, Trichy Obijivar Society, and president, Menstrual Hygiene Management Consortium, 2018 and 20. She has been joint secretary, Gestosis. <coughs> India Association and Joint Indian Fertility Society Tamil Nadu chapter we welcome you madam thank you Rishi. i must say that dr charmila we are really honored and, oh, and, and yeah, i think foxy uh, should be giving uh, dr charmila special oh, award yeah. because the type the i think she is a specialist in panels <laughs> she is <laughs> doing, uh, uh, doing panels uh, every now and then and she does it in real detail and whenever we get any you know opportunity to conduct a panel the first person who comes in our mind is dr yes, charmila so and uh, thank you thank you sir and may i take the honor to introduce our expert which is dr rosa olai and madam we are honored that you are there since the start of the program though you have more commitments with us so that shows your zeal i think and your for the subject as well as saving maternal lives i think that itself explains Uh, your zeal and your commitment to save maternal lives dr rosa olai as everybody knows she is a charming personality a very hard working personality and very committed person who has given her whole life to the care of uh, especially adolescents and uh, women's health uh, and uh, she is the director of the olai hospital and research research center board of members of committee of family planning association of india that's uh, uh, very nice chairperson of sbc madhya pradesh representative board of Trust trustees of hqq huqq south asia fellow and member board of governing council of indian college of bgyns yes she is our uh, icu governing council member vice president in 2014 she has done a lot of work in uh, uh, in maternal health and she is a figo representative to the who session of figo world congress in pre conception care 
She's been the WHO consultant expert panel for uh, the global global guidelines on adolescent sexual reproductive health. And I must say, we all remember, madam, when you were uh, 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 at the helm of affairs of that adolescent uh, so, uh, sort of uh, you brought in uh, adolescent health at the uh, key front uh, uh, with your all the work which you have done and of course we, uh, we know that lots of awards uh, the dc datta prize the foxy best publication the book uh, uh, the publication on recent advances in adolescent health a merudara hansotia award for the best committee chairperson activities we know madam how how hard you have worked and uh, uh, the publications and the books uh, to your credit more than 100 peer reviewed uh, uh, publications and uh, you, know, you have authored and co-authored very many books and we see you as an inspirational personality a person who leads from the front and the person who works in the community. So over to you, ma'am. We would uh, have your expert comments before we introduce the panelists. Thank you so much, Sureka, for your, uh, you know, first of all, inviting me to be part of this important session. I must say you work so hard yourself. I mean, I've seen the amount of good work you've been doing for so many years as a professor in the medical college, I think 20 years and above. And you've been holding these uh, seminars and webinars. You've been part of a resource person who I just came to know quality care in maternity in the, with the government of India, which is something incredible. You've been a resource person with the National Quality of Care Network, which very few doctors I know are. I mean, I don't think of anybody else except you. Uh, with the passion that you teach, with the amount of good knowledge that you have, you, have a, you brought up a lot of young gynecologists. I'm so happy to see a young panel with you. Actually, Foxy needs people like you to come up. And I think Clinical Research Committee as a committee would love to have you as a chairperson. Wish you all the best for your election, upcoming election. Work is always going on. I mean, we always, it's good to have a post in Foxy. It helps us to enhance and come up. I know Charmila, I would have loved to have her in the adolescent committee, but she went into clinical research. I must say that she's done excellent work in PCOS and adolescent. Yes, panel is someplace that she's always, I've been fond of her. She's been the elect vice president of Foxy. Wish you all the best, Charmila. Thank you, ma'am. And of course, Professor Refti, I've been working with her for a long time. Madurai, how can I forget the, you were Foxy, mm -hmm. we were together long, long years back. Rashmi, you've been coordinating it very well, very quietly, and I think, uh, the leadership in Sureka is such that she brings out the best and allows the people to come up and correspond. So decentralization is something which we must learn. I'm so happy that you're, you know, making the whole package of the whole team is such that first topics to discuss and the panel discussion, which goes into the practical aspect, you know, calling the team forward. I think we should not feel shy to involve a good team. And I think Sureka, you're doing excellent work in the area of service. And I would love to request you that, you know, to, to establish in each society a team that can handle emergencies. You know, all the societies, I know very few societies, Parag is a good friend and he's developed it in Pune, but we should have in each society a set of team for emergency. You know, post mortem hemorrhage, you know, a team that's always ready with senior gynecologists. And I'm sure you'll do this during your tenure, God willing, as it comes. Well, thank, thank you so you. much for giving up to the time because, yes, I do need to go for a function. It's a religious function for me, one of the important festivals that we have. I wish all the panelists who are with my dear Charmila, uh, Dr. Swati, Pranabika, Sangeeta, Bhaskar, Savita, Professor Jahar. I hope all of them are there, a young panelist group. Good selection, Sureka. Wish you all the best and my best wishes to all of you. Lovely to be part of thank this you. program. Thank Ma you. Ma Happy Ma festivities, ma'am. Ma'am, yes. I was in your adolescent committee, actually. I, I started. So I wanted that to be continued, but you went to some other committee. Because somebody else had stood, I couldn't stand, so I had to go to the God other. Bless you, Thank yeah, you. That shows your leadership. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, you ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rosa. And happy festivities. Happy uh, the Baha'i festivities are there. And really nice to know. And you're looking beautiful and charming as always. Thank you very much for guiding us here. And uh, with that, uh, those uh, the introductory notes, uh, we now introduce our uh, panelists. Dr. Rashmi, please. So can I take you a leave, my dear? Yes. Thank, Thank you, you very so much, much for being Thank with us through. All the best to Thank all of you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Rashmi, please uh, yes. introduce our panelists. Our first panelist is Dr. Swati Rajput. 
Dr. Swati is Professor, Department of OBGYN, Institution Medical College and Hospital, Bengal, and uh, she has many international uh, publications in international and national journals with special interest in maternal and fetal medicine and high risk pregnancy. We welcome you, Dr. Swati. Our next panelist is Dr. Pranavika Mahanta. Madam is Assistant Professor OBGYN, Deputy Superintendent James C. Secretary Jorhat OBGY Society, Assistant Secretary Dr. Sklar Jorhat, Faculty of MCI Regional Center for Faculty Development, Jorhat Medical College, Jorhat Assam. Uh, with special interest in, uh, in endoscopy and infertility, Madam is a recipient of Best Paper Award in Gofoxy and second best paper in uh, NEAOS as COA. Welcome, Madam. The next finalist is Dr. Bhaskar Sharma, Series of OBGYN Consultant, and at present he is working as Secretary at Naga OBGYN Society. We welcome you, sir. Dr. Jahad Lal Baita, Sir is Professor, Department of OBGYN, Agartala Government Medical College and GBP Hospital. And with the, uh, he's a, he has teaching experiences of 24 years and he is a postgraduate teacher for 13 years. We welcome you, sir. Dr. Sujeshri Sangita, Madam is at present a consultant OBGYN laparoscopic surgeon at Seishadri Hospital, Palapur, and she is a founder secretary Vivavaram of OBGY Society. And her special areas of interest are laparoscopy and infertility. We welcome you, ma'am. Dr. Savita Lalgaria, she is an OBGYN consultant since 20, 22 years. And she is running her own hospital in Sri Ganganagar. Exclusively, she is interested in dealing with all critical obstetric cases, and she has a very sharp hand in the process of USG. And she's a member of Fetal Medicine Committee. We welcome you, madam. So over to the moderator, Dr. Shamila. Yeah, thank you so much, Rashmi. Extremely well conducted program, uh, Sureka, uh, two excellent talks. And uh, you've given me an excellent group of panelists. I hope to learn from them uh, because uh, obstetrics is always uh, going to be a nightmare in whatever situation. You will be well prepared, but you don't know like what's going to happen the next moment. So I hope uh, I get some good input so that I also learn from this panel. We've got an esteemed group of panelists, Dr. Swati from CMC Vallo, Dr. Pranabhika, Dr. Bhaskar, Dr. Jahar Lal, Dr. Sangeeta and Dr. Savita. So when you define maternal collapse, it's an acute event. It involves the cardiorespiratory systems and all the central nervous systems. It results in a reduced or absent conscious level and sometimes potentially cardiac arrest and death at any stage in the pregnancy and up to six weeks after birth. And that's maternal collapse. So this patient, she's 34 years old. Uh, she was admitted with leaking per vaginum, labor pains. Uh, she was there for two hours with labor pains. When you see her past history, she's been married since nine years. She had both infertility conceptions. First child was a vaginal delivery, 3.2 kg. Now it's five and a half years old. On admission, uh, this lady's weight was 70 kg. Vitals were within normal limits. Upper abdomen, the uterus was 37 to 38 weeks of pregnancy. The contractions were there. Fetal heart was quite regular. All the investigations were sent. An antibiotic prophylaxis with injection septioxin was planned and, and an intradermal test dose was given. The patient has already actually had a McDonald's cervical encirclage at 18 weeks of pregnancy for a short cervix. And the suture had been removed one week back. There's no history of any medical or drug allergy. The septioxin injection has actually been administered several times previously. It's no adverse reaction. And the intradermal test was given as a 0.04 ml injection in the forearm with a one to one, uh, 100 diluted solution. And the interpretation of the test was done after 20 minutes of injection. And we usually define the positive result as a 3 mm wheel, which is raised. So at the beginning of the antibiotics and skin test itself, the patient complained of diffuse itching and burning. And within seconds, she experienced shortness of breath, cough and chest tightness. And several minutes later, she experienced dyspnea and she had a diffuse atricarial rash which was observed over her face and trunk and is followed by vomiting. Her blood pressure was 90 by 60. Heart rate was 133 beats per minute. Oxygen saturation was 93% with a high flow humidified supplemental 100% oxygen. That is 5 liter per minute was given by mask. Fetal bradycardia was there, 80 to 90 beats. 
Swati, what will be your differential diagnosis? Yeah, as it is, uh, it looks like an anaphylactic shock she has. Okay. This is the first thing which I can understand with this history because she just received the septioxone she had. Even she had a prior taken the septioxone still. Immediately after that, she had that reaction. So first thing is anaphylactic shock. Can be uh, other things like yeah, other yeah. embolism that are very rare. Great. But yes, the hypotension related to the uh, neurexial block, aorto cable compression, venous, massive venous thromboembolism, amniotic fluid embolisms, uh, septic shock, hemorrhagic shock, the uh, drug allergy and all. These are all the DDs of uh, anaphylactic. Any but, uh, as you said, shock, the, the sudden onset of atricaria with itching, angioedema, stridor or wheezing, which happens with hypotension, usually supports yes. a diagnosis of anaphylaxis. Of anaphylactic shock, yes. Yeah, Only with the pregnancy, uh, like this, there will be the persistent hypotension will be there. It is a predominant feature, especially okay. with the pregnancy. Other things are the same with the anaphylaxis in pregnancy non or non-pregnancy, no. they have the same. Second thing is vulval and vaginal itching, which will be also the intense uh, angioedema always it will be there again one more thing in the anaphylactic shock with the pregnancy i have uh, seen which is the low backache and the um, preterm labor pain pre type of features like the uterine cramps they will have and the fetal yes. distress like as you said the fetal bradycardia was there yeah so, so as yeah. you said the characteristic feature is a vulval and the vaginal itching which starts intense itching they say and they'll yes. have that low backache a very characteristic you'll think she has gone into like full labor like that the symptoms will start and here in this yes. patient she had a uh, features of bronchospasm so we are clear that it's almost like anaphylaxis there was no large volume blood loss like a pph or a hemorrhagic shock so we exclude that and there was no coagulopathy to say that there was some uh, hemorrhage which has happened or an abrupt show just happened and it's caused that shock feature in such a patient so we have come to a conclusion that it may be anaphylaxis so pranabika dr pranabika how will you manage this patient now yes. Uh, first of all, uh, I will call for help, critical care person, and I'll give adrenaline step dose in the delta I am point one uh, point uh, five milligram I am step and uh, give oxygen as you all have started in this case. Then uh, patients you, will be you give better. no you give adrenaline IV or IM. I am I am I am I am you I am okay. I am I am and critical care person used to come when uh, we had an experience recent actually okay. then uh, they call for the critical care person and uh, we give also steroid uh, hydrocortisone okay. or whatever is available actually it may be hydrocortisone takes little time to make so dexona is easily uh, available so whatever is there we used to give then um, we elevate the legs so that uh, the pressure can be managed and we give crystalloid uh, fast actually to uh, get the volume and the, for that case we need to give isotonic uh, like saline one liter we gave and then uh, <clears throat> we can give inotropic agents also if the VP is falling then um, no but the in initial stage I'm asking she still we have not crossed okay. the del even the delivery part is we have not crossed initial okay, uh, resuscitation okay. Initially, that um, uh, oh. like left atrial elevation of the head, then uh, we will uh, give another dose of adrenaline if it is not improving, not actually. Uh, every every five minutes. Airway, airway, okay. airway, no, no. Airway. So, Dr. Sujeshri, please uh, let Dr. Pranabika finish. Yeah, we'll just yeah. so uh, if uh, initial phase, it is like if critical care anesthesia person, they comes and uh, they actually, uh, for that patient, you see recovered, uh, the patient I was talking about. Okay. Uh, she so, had allergy to tranexamic acid. Okay. So, it was oh. a very bad experience, experience we had it. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, she recovered. If she doesn't recover, then probably we would have continued okay. adrenaline yeah. increasing. Yeah. Thank you. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So you will actually give her adrenaline, give her hydrocot, uh, give her a will yeah. that also we give, give IV fluid yeah. so that you maintain her blood pressures and we'll put her in the left, left lateral so that you take off the iota cable compression, which can aggravate the hypotension yeah. which is happening. So Dr. Yes, Sujeshri, what is your thought on that? You wanted to say something? I thought uh, first it would be, uh, my first thought was to maintain access to the airway first. Because once angio or edema is said to be difficult. No, the, uh, Dr. Pranabika is calling, calling a critical care pay, pay, pay person for that. So she's preparing. Did, yeah. But the initial resuscitation, what you can do in the labor yeah. room when the patient is collapsing after an intradermal injection. Yeah, and uh, uh, preferably two large board cannulas on either side, one for the fluid and one for the medication. And if they have some amount of stride or obesity, you can always consider nebulization. Okay. Uh, also, it should be uh, mandatory. Here, a small mention. 
if you uh, epinephrine or uh, it has to be given IM initially because if you have to give it uh, intravenous, you then require a critical I mean critical care expert or a person with experience for that. Yeah, yeah. We'll, come, we'll, come, we'll come to that. We'll come to that. So this patient, as both the panelists said, we put her in the left lateral position, gave her oxygen, a, center, a second intravenous line was accessed and we started normal saline. We gave her antihistamines and hydrocortisone, and, but we did not give epinephrine. We did not give epinephrine for this patient. And to prevent the adverse outcome for the baby, because the fetal hypoxia had started, we shifted the baby mother to the uh, theater, gave, did an emergency cesarean section. The baby was resuscitated and shifted to the NICU. So we didn't give epinephrine, but both the panels were emphatic in saying that epinephrine needs to be given. Uh, is it uh, like uh, we always scared of giving epinephrine during pregnancy? Dr. Baskar, what are your thoughts on that? Dr. Baskar? He's joined? Yeah, it's Dr. Jayar Lal Baid. Yeah, Bhaskar Sarma sir is uh, there or not? I saw I him. Know. Okay. Uh, Rashmi, I, I can't see him. Okay, Dr. Sujeshri, you can take that. Uh, epinephrine should be the first line of uh, management for uh, drug because. But why are you insisting that you will not give intravenous? Um, when it comes to intravenous, dosing is very important. You have to be very confident with the dosing when you're playing with the uh, vasopressors, anything with the intravenous route. There, what happens is preferably establishing a central venous line and then giving uh, a vaso or any of the vasopressors intravenous because otherwise they can cause tissue damage if there's any extravasation. So preferably oh. as a first line, intramuscular would suffice. You can start them on epinephrine in 1 is 2,000 dilution, give them 0.5 to 1 uh, ml and then wait for 5 minutes. See how they respond. This is the first drug which will counter your hypotension, Hyper. the bronchospasm and also the anaphylaxis per se. Oh. You can give up to three doses every five minutes uh, to see uh, if there's... Till the patient recovers, yes. Just a and small mention, if the patient is on any beta blockers, then this effect is dampened. So then you can consider other agents like uh, glucagon. Otherwise, epinephrine is a wonderful first-line drug. And you will not have glucagon in all your small centers. Uh, so no, uh, I, I think you should be very, much, very, very much comfortable when giving epinephrine. And uh, suppose even your intramuscular does not work, it's worthwhile going for an intravenous because yes, you yes. need to bring out the patient from the patient bronchospasm because it's a mast cell act overactivity which is causing this problem. So you need to bring the patient out. And the benefit yes. of maintaining the adequate maternal blood pressure is very, very important. And that's why giving epinephrine is not wrong in during an anaphylactic reaction, even in pregnancy. So do not hesitate in giving uh, intramuscular dose of epinephrine when you suspect an anaphylactic reaction because maintaining the maternal blood pressure is very important because you, that's what is going to help the placental perfusion also and it's going to help the baby also. So do not hesitate and that's the guidelines from the anesthesia association. So we can take it uh, in a correct sense. And the caveats in management of anaphylactic reaction is inject epinephrine promptly as both the panelists said. Give high flow supplemental oxygen, whatever you have in your labor room as fast as possible. Position in the mother on her left side to improve the venous return to the heart. Maintain a minimum maternal systolic blood pressure of 90 millimeter mercury because that is needed for maintenance of the placental perfusion. Do a continuous fetal monitoring and suppose the baby is going for bradycardia. It's worthwhile continuing a resuscitation, shifting the mother for an emergency cesarean delivery. Dr. Jakar sir, why was there a trigger in pregnancy in spite of this lady having previously septrioxin injection and now she's going for a anaphylactic reaction? What are your thoughts on that? Dr. Uh, Jakar sir? Yes, sir. Uh, good, uh, so probably this was the case actually what we are dealing with. Uh, the patient who had to give uh, antibiotics, uh, the, probably the septrioxin is one uh, thing we can think about is this. One important uh, issue is here the patients who already had a septraxin earlier can have a repeat reaction with the septraxin while you are giving it. So that is one important point here. But be very see? careful because just, just because she has had injections before, do not avoid giving a uh, test dose before you give uh, when she comes oh. again for a checkup because they say there's an altered immunological status. So Dr. Jafar, sir? And the prior dose could have been a sensitizing dose. That's why the subsequent dose could give an uh, exacerbated reaction. Exacerbated reaction. It, she went for an exaggerated reaction. Now. Dr. Jafar, sir. So what are the maternal and fetal effects when you have an anaphylactic reaction? And this particular, this anaphylaxis uh, during pregnancy, of course, we have a very catastrophic uh, events that is for both uh, responsible for uh, 
having a severe problem in the mother as well as fetus. As already been discussed that the mothers had a uh, hypovolemia or hypo, hypotension and uh, because of that, there are many complications that can arise to the fetus also. Yes. So what we have to do, uh, this kind of uh, cases, we have to continue monitoring as both mother as well as uh, the fetus. Yes. And Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please continue, sir. Uh, at any point of time, if you find that this, there is a fetal distress, we have to take into uh, action that has been done in this case. Yes. A patient shifted immediately to the OT and emergency cesarean section was done. We cannot delay because any delay they can cause new... Uh, uh, new and and that it may hamper your resuscitation effects also when efforts also when you have a big baby inside the uh, uh, uterine cavity. So it's better if you deliver so that the resuscitation of the mother also continues uh, unhampered. And yes. uh, uh, thank you so much, sir. So, Dr. Sangeeta, like, how would you be how would you prevent such a reaction, or uh, is that something like we can be prepared uh, in a, a labor room or a theater, Dr. Savita? Uh, prevention as such would be most of them would be drug induced because it's a hospital setting, and yes, the sir. common medication would be antibiotic, either penicillin, cephalosporins, or NSAIDs. Commonly, what we encounter. So preferably, as you already mentioned, ma'am, give a test dose. Even if they've received the drug previously, do give a test dose and then follow it up with the uh, complete dose. And uh, also take a history for any reactions to painkillers previously. This would help us prevent this to a large extent. Preparedness, yes, you have to be prepared. Anything can go wrong at any time. So preferably your emergency drug box should have all the required medication. As I mentioned, obviously epinephrine, your steroids, along with that, your histamine blockers, intravenous, uh, and also you can uh, requirement of uh, nebulization. You can have your other uh, acetylene yes. inhalational agents also to help you in case of strider or bleed. So preparedness is very important. Have all your cannulas, all the sizes, your uh, everything within easy access. One mention should be made because during pregnancy, what happens is because of the physiological changes in a few cases when there's excessive bronchospasm or edema, intubation may become difficult. So have access to a person who's experienced in... Uh, Incubation and also they should have a backup plan if they fail to intubate. They should also be prepared for emergency cricothyroid or something. Yes. Uh, so you have an emergency protocol because mm -hmm. we will be able to manage the nurse who's going to give the, give the injection should also be prepared to do the emergency measures to prevent the mother going for catastrophic effect, effects. So that's why your drills are very, very important when you're having a labor room nurse and please teach her well and make sure that she's drilled correctly. And as the first panelist said, you will be calling for assistance always when there's an emergency and you involve every specialist possible who can help you. The anesthesiologist, the internist, the op another obstetrician, a senior obstetrician and a neonatologist. And uh, regarding epinephrine, already the panelists have said, and we are very clear, you will give IM epinephrine when there's an anaphylactic reaction. And the most important thing is tell your staff nurse to stop the drip which is causing the reaction. They'll be continuing the drip and giving the resuscitation also. It's, it's going to aggravate the condition. So they have to stop whatever injection they are giving, throw it away and start the uh, emergency uh, regime for, for the CPR, whatever you're starting. And uh, epinephrine is the main uh, treatment for this condition because it's going to decrease the uh, mediator release from uh, the mast cells and it should not be delayed by taking time to administer your steroids and other injections as it happened in this case. Luckily, we escaped, but it, uh, epinephrine should have been the first choice to prevent this condition becoming worse. And as the panelists said, two IV lines should be in place and saline should be infused very, very rapidly. The mother should be continuously monitored by with the heart rate, oxygenation, the pulse oximetry and the fetal heart rate. And CPR should be performed whenever indicated. Dr. Savita, suppose this anaphylactic reaction is refractory to the basic initial treatment given by Dr. Pranabhika. What are we going to do now? Dr. Savita? Yeah, please unmute yourself, Savita. Yeah. yeah. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Yeah. When a uh, patient is not recovering from an uh, from adrenaline we have given twice, I am injection. Still, patient is in anaphylactic show. We have to think about another vasopressor drugs. We have to give her upper or lower uh, airway obstruction uh, that is unresponsive to initial medical management. Oh, to, to intubate Intubation. her first. Uh, intubate her first. Intubate yes. and really tracheostomy may be required, ma'am. An endotracheal yes. tube insertion should be performed by most experienced healthcare professional. We are calling intensive care anesthetist. And available, which can be difficult, but when there is pregnancy, acid edema or the upper airway, 
and if the tongue is swollen or if the larynx and other landmarks in the upper ear are obscured because of edema and mucus and we have to check the hypotension it should be reversed promptly with large volume of iv fluid up to 7 liters of raw fluid may be needed and mem minimum maternal systolic blood pressure of 90 mg of mercury should be maintained to ensure adequate perfusion and vasopressors mam we can give uh, vaso uh, patient experience hypertension or shock refractory to basic initial treatment with first aid doses of epinephrine and iv fluid resuscitation they require now intravenous vasopressors these are norad simultaneously with vasopressin we can give norad is the dose of uh, 2 to 20 microgram per minute and vasopressin dose of 4 to 40 microgram per hour if needed simultaneously triple uh, vasopressors we are giving through infusion pump and the frequent dose titration and based on continuous non invasive monitoring of heart rate blood pressure and oxygenation man yeah perfect so actually uh, suppose a patient is not recovering intubator as fast as possible and sometimes it will be very difficult as dr sujeshri also was saying you need the most experienced person to help you in intubation and hypotension you need lots of iv fluid sometimes to Uh, re recover the blood pressure, and you have to maintain it around 90 millimeters of mercury. And as Dr. Savita said, you will need to go for intravenous vasopressors in combination to maintain the blood pressures. And cardio respiratory, uh, cardio pulmonary resuscitation. Every should everybody should be uh, totally like in sync when you are managing because it cannot be delayed when you need to manage the mother. And uh, so there's one test which they are saying is quite useful for confirmation. of the diagnosis of whether it's anaphylaxis and that is measuring the mast cell tryptase levels but i don't think it's available swati it's available in cmc vellore mast cell tryptase uh, no it is not available, available here but yes yes i read in the books also the serum uh, tryptase uh, assay we can do but it is not available in uh, cmc at present to actually to save yourself from mid medico legal problem if it's available please do and confirm that it happened by her itself and you did not do anything to the mother because you will be blamed yes. first and there's something called a local anesthetic toxicity which you may which you always see when you're going to give an episiotomy you're given a local dose and the patient can have a reaction please remember you will need to give intralipid 20 person for such a patient because lipid re rescue is the most important treatment for a local anesthetic to toxicity with lignocaine so keep it ready in your labor rooms always and it's a rcog guideline keep it ready because it's very useful for lignocaine toxicity so this, we'll go on to the second case this patient is uh, a gravida 2 a previous vaginal delivery she had gdm during a first pregnancy but now she is over diabetic on insulin and she was admitted at 38 weeks for an induction she has got good glycemic control first she is induced with foley's catheter and 24 hours later a gel was kept and then 4 hours after the second gel she started having contractions the patient was on continuous fetal monitoring she had a spontaneous rupture of membranes 5 hours after the gel insertion uh, the on examination the uterus is term having contractions uh, once in 10 uh, one, one, one in 10 minutes there are three contractions 35 seconds the head is unengaged per vaginal examination cervix is well effaced 4 cm dilated membranes absent vertex at minus 3 15 minutes after that examination the patient becomes unresponsive dr pranabika what next she had uh, hello can you hear me yeah yeah yeah, yeah yes yes you are already busy uh, since uh, she is in labor and she had sudden collapse and she is not responding the first thing will come that it can be amniotic fluid embolism um, because uh, she is in labor and there is also rupture of membrane the uh, amniotic fluid might go up but yes uh, she uh, when she is having this we have to evaluate her uh, properly actually Uh, she may have hypotension then fetal bradycardia obviously would be there so uh, other than amniotic fluid embolism what else can it be sudden uh, collapse like that. anything be, it may be heart failure also yeah because we are seeing failure. quite a number of myocardial so infarct uh, arrest cardiac arrest with myocardial yeah myocardial infarct yeah could be cardiac arrest may be there and also embolism. pulmonary embolism pulmonary it can be yeah so it can be And DIC, uh, like uh, DIC will be little rare. It happens. Little it will it, yeah. be an ongoing process. But sudden uh, collapse like that. Could be anaphylactic shock also. Fall of, it can be still anaphylactic shock. Sudden fall shock. in BP. Sudden fall in BP. It can, it uh, can like, be. It can be rarely an aortic aneurysm. 
we yeah. are sudden collapse because they'll be in labor suddenly they'll collapse okay. and uh, it can be because it will have all the classical features because it's all a cardiac event yeah. it shock can be also there like uh, because we see is in labor for a longer time uh, yes. that can also be there okay okay so th <laughs> this is uh, uh, amniotic fluid embolism we are taking it as amniotic fluid embolism at the present time it's a rare potentially lethal complication frequency is 1.9 to 1.6.1 per 100000 births mortality rate is around 60% many of us got a limited experience with the management of amniotic fluid embolism we have to accept that and you always put it as a waste paper basket uh, diagnosis when you don't have anything else we say it's amniotic fluid embolism so what is the diagnostic crit criteria pranabika to say that it's definitely amniotic fluid embolism yeah uh, first uh, it's you will uh, have acute dyspnea Yes, uh, it has to be acute dyspnea and see so like usually they have cough. Actually, uh, you will see that the patient becomes very jittery. She becomes suddenly very uh, uh, like uh, for the person who starts restless, very restless. Yes. They become that's the first yeah. symptom of uh, uh, yeah. something going wrong with the uh, yeah. oxygen. Yeah, craving yes. for oxygen, craving for oxygen, and uh, there can be hypotension and in uh, and um, cyanosis can be there. peripherally yes. we could see cyanosis mm -hmm. can be there and no, uh, that, that, that all can happen in other conditions also like what actually, is like uh, specific for amniotic fluid which is more of a diagnosis of exclusion uh, so jay let uh, dr prana bika sir we'll come to yes yes uh, diagnostic yeah um, uh, like um, see you said that yeah. abrupt onset of dyspnea uh, yeah, that that yeah, yeah. that is the first criteria Yeah, then when D I D I C app happens in amniotic, yeah. it doesn't happen in the other conditions in like infarction, your even your pulmonary. D I C uh, will get little time and like. Little time. Yeah. But now what it I'm is, saying is yeah, the end of it when you're putting a diagnosis for a person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This then this chronological order when it happens, yeah, it usually yeah. is amniotic. If it is pulmonary embolism, we will not have D I C. If it is amniotic fluid embolism, we will get even in postpartum, we will have like if we do autopsy, we will get like amniotic fluid embolism. We will get even in postpartum, we will have like if we do autopsy, we will get amniotic fluid in the lung. And so, anything which happens is, around the labor, like acute, yeah, like, uh, 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 ARM. Suppose she is hyperstimulated, yeah. or suppose you, she she has she has had a like a, a, a hypotonic uterus. All that somehow yeah. will uh, uh, will actually uh, relate to relate to uh, uh, embolism. To yes, ma'am. Yes. Anybody has got an experience of managing amniotic fluid embolism? Sujaya, you have got an experience? Ma'am, in the uh, PG life, not in as independent consultant. Like, what was the presentation for the patient? Uh, Ma'am, the patient went into spontaneous labor and she ruptured her membrane. The spontaneous rupture was not an ARM, and following that, within twenty minutes, uh, she went into collapse. a uh, collapse. We so, couldn't revive the patient okay. because we were just postgraduates. It was a night shift, so okay. we lost the patient. Okay. But uh, Anabhi, it was. Uh, Anabhi, I had an experience, ma'am. Uh, okay. that was i i'm not sure whether it was amniotic fluid embolism or not okay. but my anesthesia person said that it was embolism, embolism. Uh, amniotic because uh, it was a case of placenta accreta as uh, just okay. uh, four years back i had this bad experience uh, then i just uh, like gone through the like i have taken it as a classical incision i was giving in the uterus because it was a accreta case i have just given the incision over the uterus and the patient collapsed okay Suddenly, okay. the patient collapsed. The placenta had not separated at all. The placenta had not separated at all. Yes, nothing had happened. Nothing oh. had happened. I have just given the incision over the uterus, and okay. I, that is what I, is confusing till date. Actually, why the patient could, died? Could it, was, could it? Could it have been like a spinal shock? No, ma'am. She was in, under general anesthesia. General anesthesia. She was oh. under general anesthesia general because anesthesia. it was a parkrita case. So okay, everyone okay. was prepared that we will take time and will need uh, resuscitation in between. So okay. she was on under general anesthesia, oh. and uh, after giving incision, she collapsed. Okay. And uh, yeah. the uh, anesthesia person said that it can be. Amniotic. Yeah, yeah, it looks like classical. And uh, did you do an echo at that time? What did you find in the no, thing? No, 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 no. no. Echo no. like uh, it, nothing was done after that because uh, like patient also didn't want anything. She was okay. like they were prepared only since it was a parkita case, high risk consent. Oh, okay, okay. Comfortable okay. like that consent also used to be taking uh, like before parkita case. Okay, okay. So, okay. Uh, so she was like she was anemic also. But uh, the presentation was like anesthetist said me that it is a case of amniotic fluid. Okay, Doctor Savita, oh, have you oh, felt? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> very. <laughs> I, I know <laughs> Sunny Sa Bhagwan was not very with you that day. Uh, Doctor Savita, have you faced an amniotic fluid embolism? No, no, ma'am. Luckily, I have not faced. Doctor Jagarlal wants to say something. 
sir you have no, seen a abhi mahesh yeah. hmm. actually unfortunately this most of the cases of sudden death uh, where uh, we cannot ascertain the cause of the death i think we should uh, request for a post mortem examination and it's we can mandate get... it's mandate you need to know what's yes, happening sir. otherwise uh, exactly. ne- yeah and uh, dr uh, swati must be seeing lots of cases swati in cmc yes, wallo yes. yeah yeah i have seen a uh, few cases of aortic fluid what is the commonest the percent thing, like, commonest percent yeah. what's the commonest percent so i have one patient recently she had she was okay. a staff nurse so very well educated and all she just okay. induced okay and she was in labor okay she delivered the baby also and before uh, expelling the placenta she oh. just become like air hunger was there she was very hypoxic and suddenly she started moving just like a pre eclectic imminent could have been, no could have been a rupture uterus so we thought of that but there was nothing we did is immediately this one because we have anesthetists always all the time okay. intubated we did all the thing even we took till the ecmo also for her okay. and she was not willing for the autopsy because she was my patient so i i was very keen on knowing the reason for that okay and finally they said it is a amniotic fluid only because it was such a sudden like the baby delivered at 2 o'clock in the midnight 2 2 am okay. and 2 3 we lost her like oh. we did cp everything for Okay, okay. And That's sad. Yeah. So like it was not a okay. uh, miss or anything. Swati, you can take this. How does it occur? How does this disease progress? What is the progression uh, of this acute disease? Yeah, it is the because it usually occurs during the labor or in thirty minutes of the uh, birth. It it usually occurs, and here also the patient will have. like for my patient also she has air hunger. She had a seizures. What I said like a imminent signs. She had a suddenly. she became restless and arrested immediately so yeah and after some time she had that frothy discharge and like a pulmonary edema stuff also she had okay. so the pulmonary hypertension the left any coagulopathy features you should you can you could have you yes. you, you you documented a coagulopathy there? yes 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 so okay. she had a suddenly like before the placenta expulsion like what we have a phase of uh, retraction then expulsion of the placenta okay. and then the gush of the blood comes so okay. for her sudden expulsion of the placenta with lots of blood and uterus become very atonic oh, you could so. not do anything there yeah perfect so, so if that yours is perfect uh, yes like, yours is a clear diagnosis of amniotic fluid embolism because everything the features of uh, amniotic fluid embolism has progressed in her uh, as it yeah. happens in an embolism so the patient usually collapses during labor or birth and that's usually 30 minutes within uh, within that time usually but rarely they have seen yeah. even later on and it, it's in the form of an acute hypotension respiratory distress and acute hypoxia seizures and cardiac arrest may occur the, the the initial presentation will be a pulmonary hypotension and that's because of the vascular occlusion by the amniotic fluid debris or because of the vascular constriction because of the inst- uh, it is an anaphylactoid reaction so it's an acute anaphylactoid reaction and that causes that uh, pulmonary hypertension and sometimes it resolves but sometimes it will not resolve and then it goes on to left ventricular dysfunction and then the failure starts coagulopathy will develop if the mother survives long enough often giving rise to mazu pph if amniotic fluid embolism occurs prior to birth the baby is going to suffer in the form of a profound fetal distress and actually the underlying pathological process here is uh, it's almost similar to severe sepsis or anaphylaxis and that is usually because of the complement activation because of the debris entering the pulmonary circulation so dr swati how will you resuscitate you tried in your yeah. patient but what yes, all the measures yes. you done yeah so for the resuscitation the cardiopulmonary resuscitation we have to do for this immediately you have to call for the help and because if the baby is inside and second thing when the baby is out so these two conditions so when the baby is inside like when she is still pregnant and you have uh, suddenly you have seen this uh, you have you are supposed to do the cpr on that immediately call for help second thing positioning of the patient here the left, uh, lateral dis- uterine displacement you have to do with the one hand and second thing immediately see the time of uh, arrest because you are going to go further whether you are the baby is inside then you have to take it out within a certain time oh. so the timing is important then second thing you have to start the cardiopulmonary resuscitation so here first the circulation so you have to look for the carotid pulse feel the pulse if pulse is there or not pulse is not there immediately start the uh, chest compression and chest compression here they usually say it should be the high quality chest compression you have to do like almost 2 to 3 inches down the sternum you have to press the uh, with with your uh, 
hands. So you have to do it almost 100 per minute you have to do. After that, even after that also, the breathing is there or not, you have to check. Before checking the breathing, do the head tilt and the chin lift, you should do. Then yes. after that, look for the, uh, by the time when you look for the airway, everything is fine or not. Then uh, by the time, I think, I hope uh, the help will Anasa come. If will the come. help yeah, is there, yeah. then call for yeah. the <laughs> defibrillation and, and if it is not, please go ahead with the uh, yes. delivery of the baby. Yes, like yes. that is a perimortem. Yes. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah. So this patient, as you said, we started the CPR, code blue was activated. She was intubated within two minutes. The patient was shifted to the theater, a cesarean section was done, and we delivered a 3.7 kg asphyxiated baby. The baby was intubated and admitted in the NICU. Uh, Dr. Jagar, was it right to do an emergency cesarean delivery for her? Jagar, sir? Sir, can you unmute yourself? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, it's appropriate to do that because while we are continuing to do the CPR and uh, waiting for the response, and of course, uh, you have to see the viability of the, uh, uh, the pregnancy also, the fetus also. If the fetus, we feel that the fetus is going to be viable. We must do a peripotum, uh, perimortem cesarean section. Uh, this is one uh, way. Another thing is that by doing this, we can also uh, helping the mother to uh, resuscitate properly and adequately. Suppose, so this, she's, suppose she's not in the theater. You are, you're seeing in the casualty and she's collapsed there. Will you, you should, do a cesarean section there or you will shift her to the theater and then do? Yeah, you should not shift the patient to the theater. You should do it immediately there okay. itself because it should be done uh, within a five minutes time or if, if there is no response or response. Uh, because it is said that even no consent to be obtained for that. You need not take a consent okay. for the patient party. And uh, best of interest, the patient uh, should undergo this kind of procedures. And uh, this procedure should be done very quickly and should be done by very experienced the incision, uh, uh, type of incision, either it's a vertical incision or a transverse incision, depends on the surgeons. Of course, the caesarean uh, 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 uterine incision, it always should be the uh, classical type where you can quickly go in and take out the baby. Uh, have you done a perimortem caesarean, sir? Have the experience of doing a perimortem caesarean? We have done it. We have done it. You have, you have done. Where did you do it? In the casualty or in the labor room? No, oh, it, it, is, it is in labor room only. You have labor done. room, okay. No. Dr. Pranabhika, you have done uh, perimortem, sir, peri no, no, perimortem. No, 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 no. Sang Sangeeta? No, ma'am. No, I have Sa done Sa four. Savita has done four. No, no I have done four. I have done uh, in the, actually in the burn ward. Patient was a 90% burn and she was gasping. Ah, yeah, yeah, I've done for, a, I did, I did for a 100% burns once. That was in the casualty. And once I did for a person who had a vertebral fracture. And, I did uh, one for H1N1 positive patient. Okay. okay. And, we, and so it, it, it's not, I mean, you have to take quick decisions. Yeah, you don't need any anesthetist or anything. Just take put a, take a scalpel, go one shot, one incision. And sometimes you can go through that incision only and take out the baby also. Sometimes we go I think very the deep. decision is important. important. You know, okay. many a times what happens, we, we don't take that decision. That's, that's, I think, uh, uh, doing a cesarean section, we know it's uh, it's simple, It's but to take the decision <laughs> and to do it in the ward itself, that's yeah. what I think yeah. takes that jigger, which we say, na? To jigger be <laughs> To be prepared for that. <laughs> Dr. Sangeeta, any investigations to guide therapy for a person who's had suffered a amniotic fluid embolism? Or would you like to do any special in investigations to confirm that? Because many of the panelists said they have, uh, the amniotic fluid embolism, that sequence was not as it was. And sometimes without even a post-mortem, they have to say that it was amniotic fluid embolism. So any investigations to guide therapy and to confirm the diagnosis? This is actually a diagnosis of uh, exclusion, ma'am. So initially, mm -hmm. we have to get the basic test done, like the CPC, the platelet count, the blood grouping, and you have to do a PT, a PT INR, rule out uh, coagulopathy, and then follow it up with an ECG chest x which look for pulmonary edema or other causes. So primarily, ECG changes for any cardiac uh, uh, factor. Once you rule out all this, and you, most importantly, history of either recent delivery or you know, which is set in minutes to hours following delivery. No, no, I'm you. asking. We have gone across that. Now we are coming to the, any investigation. Any investigation, and uh, otherwise, also off date you have serum uh, uh, triptase and also zinc corporate which is not available everywhere. Otherwise, also uh, uh, if you have a pulmonary artery catheter aspirate, and you can see yes. that there is a issue in it. 
Which many is, times he will not have even in a pulmonary artery catheter. So it is quite clear. Otherwise, clear. also even if it is present, ma'am, it's seen even in a normal uh, pregnancy. Normal pregnancy. You can't take it as the diagnosis. For the so it will be actually the clinical picture. How it progresses. I think that documentation you do correctly, you will be saved in any court of law. Do not panic, but go, just think over and document correctly so that you know what how the patient has progressed. Dr. Savita, are there any supportive measures for a person who has suffered an amniotic fluid embolism other than CPR? Yeah, ma'am. Uh, to provide high uh, high quality, this cardiopulmonary resuscitation and recommendation to perform transthoracic or transesophageal echocardiography. If you have the facility, always do a transthoracic or a transesophageal echo because that will give you one diagnosis of right ventricular failure which is going on to become left ventricular failure. So if you have the facility, please do that because you will have a documentation that it may be amniotic fluid. Because the pulmonary pressure is getting affected, will reflect on the right side of the heart and you will have a documentation there. Yes, please proceed, Dr. Savita. Yeah. And if such failure is identified, the treatment that is tailored in improving right ventricular performance should be initiated with the use of inotropic drugs, man, and pulmonary vasodilators. So by the time you will ask, as Swati said, you would have called the intensivist, uh, uh, tell them, please take care of uh, the patient as well as uh, my, my, my health is also going to deteriorate now because when you see an amniotic fluid embolism in labor, that's it. You, will, you are not going to recover for the next 10 years. So this is the actually the trans uh, thoracic echocardiography picture we should be familiar with because you cannot put uh, some echo report and say that it was amniotic fluid embolism. You need this picture to say that the right side of the heart has got enlarged and that's going to uh, going to impinge on the interventricular septum and that's going to push the left ventricle also and that's going to aggravate the systemic hypotension because the pressures are going to fall more and more the right ventricle is getting enlarged and it's going to push on the interventricular septum so this is a very very important finding which you can if you have the facility if you've got a a, a, a a very good cardiologist he will document this so that it will be very useful for you so this patient after uh, delivery, she developed repeated cycles of maternal bradycardia. We were giving her vasoprocess su supports and we did an echo which showed a grossly dilated right atrium, right ventricle with a compressed left ventricle. Dr. Swati, what are the precautions and management you follow in a managing an amniotic fluid embolism? Can you just keep on pouring fluid into her because she's hypotensive? Because no, many, no. we tend to do that. Many of us tend to do that. Yeah. Judicially, uh -huh. Judicious use of uh, fluid should be done. And if the DIC is there, then give the blood and the other products. Keep the blood pressure around like uh, uh, around 70 to 80 uh, uh, blood pressure, mean arterial okay. blood pressure you have to keep. Uh, yes, the sepsis and other things which can be coinciding with that. So you have to take care of the antibiotic and other things also you have to take care of that. And definitely the oxygen supply should always be there. And when the patient has survived the cardiac arrest, do not keep on giving 100% oxygen because that hyperoxia yes, yes. may actually worsen the ischemia reperfusion injury which has happened in the lungs. So to be very careful on that. Maintain the pulse oximeter around 94 to 98%. And please remember the serum glucose levels also have to be maintained around 140 to 180. So Dr. Pranabhika, yes. right heart failure, like, uh, thank you, Swati. Right heart failure, uh, the management of it. I know it will go, it goes into the purview of an intensivist or an anesthetist, but something yeah. we need to know uh, how they are managing. That's what I want. Uh, sim in simple okay. terms. Simple, uh, like, um, which phase he is in that we have to determine, actually, if he is having dyspnea and all those days, what is called is uh, like WHO stays three or four, then probably we need to have diabetes first and uh, find out the cause of failure. Uh, if she has some myopathy or hypertension previous that we have to deal with, we have to talk with cardiologists, we have to have a uh, multidisciplinary approach, approach. To it and uh, approach and uh, uh, we have to uh, try her like uh, whatever symptoms she has actually, if it is having dyspnea then uh, if she has uh, hypotension or that sort of things we have to maintain and uh, we will try to maintain her pressure and uh, at, at the same time we the, 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 the point is here. the point is do not hesitate in giving vasopressors that is the point because vasopressors are going to save her as much as possible 
so consider norepinephrine for the right ventricular right. failure no, right. and and dobutamine and mildenone whenever needed should be started and that will be all under the purview of the anesthetist and the interventions yeah. we are not going yeah, to do cardiologist uh, we take the help of cardiologist and okay. we no uh, yeah yes. that is if then a patient is collapsing the what i'm saying is you call everybody at the same time so that all of them come and give you an opinion so that you do the correct time because it's a very yeah. acute event you cannot afford to wait and it is very difficult to diagnose also for us because for the first time we get the patient and what type of failure we don't know we can just see that she is in failure no so, no uh, prana because see 10 years back we did not have all this information in our hand but now we have got the information so the next person suppose she develops we should be prepared you should be yes. prepared to give dobutamine you should be prepared to give norepinephrine by the time uh, intensivist comes to the picture because uh, yes. we uh, because we need to you know, reduce our maternal mortality rate as much as possible so whatever yes. works we have to do uh, tra tra train your staff nurses train yourself do something but yes. next time an amniotic fluid embolism happens we should have the guts to manage it from the start and try to do the best possible before because we know that our intensivists are going to help us but that initial time because sometimes they come late 15 30 minutes and something to do and when you do all this correctly and document correctly no court can put us in any problem anywhere we'll be confident in talking i did this i did that and this happened in spite of that because otherwise uh, uh, that, that is a point yes ma'am sometimes we have confusing situations like uh, she will have craps in her chest she has hypotension we cannot uh, like uh, that time we are like little thing that we are starting norad also we are starting lessics also but no, we are giving no, all you, you, you put a, no, you put you put a protocol for yourself this happens yes, this has happened this creps are there how what i'll do you put it in a yes, protocol base it will be very easy because you are the one who sitting there nobody else can tell you like this yes. was right and this was wrong because you are managing in the tuck because 2 o'clock swati faced that patient imagine what yes. all you what help can you get at 2 o'clock in any other center when yes, see yes. lur was not able to do that okay yes ma'am yes. so these are the drugs which have been advocated for acute right ventricular failure and keep this in your uh, labor room theater so that at least you know what can be done when an, an emergency happens Uh, Dr. Baskar is not there. Dr. Pranabika, can you continue? Like, uh, suppose coagulopathy happens. Swati has already yes, said that we'll go for a mazo transfusion protocol. Yes, ma'am. And uh, we will go for. Uh, yeah. So that's why when you take blood, no, yeah. send for all the profiles. So because when she's yeah. developing coagulation uh, defect, defects there later on, you will know what's happening and how fast can you give. So yeah, mazo transfusion. Yes, yes. ma'am. Then we'll do platelet yes. if FFP is required. We'll give that. Right. and uh, as uh, swati had which also will add to the picture so you have to be very careful about that coagulopathy with uterine atony it's going to be a nightmare to manage and suppose she has delivered vaginally and then she has gone for a coagulopathy those episiotomy areas can become hematomas please remember that also you have to check for that she will be losing blood in a hematoma there now to jagar what about left ventricular failure management uh, anything different this sir? is something Uh, something different because we have to consider actually how hemodynamically patient is stable we have to concentrate uh, more on cardiogenic drugs because here the ventricle is failed and not able to pump out the blood so we have to uh, think about the drugs that directly acts on the heart yes. so so that's by, because that the edema what is going to have in a pulmonary system is because of the left ventricular failure so you have to think about how hemodynamically we can make her stable by the use of all this uh, best Uh, inotropic supports and vasopressors so that uh, and one important thing is what you have to think again and again i think you are saying that you have to carefully give their fluid when you are uh, treating these kind of patients yes because what we tend to think in a collapsed patient is we, we think it's like hemorrhage we keep on loading them with iv fluids please don't do that as sir said so clearly it is a heart which is failing it's not the, the peripheral system which is failing it's a heart which is failing so you need to give vasopressors to make that heart at least pump again to produce that blood pressure just needed for the mother a perfect answer thank you sir dr jahar dr sangeeta suppose she develops arrhythmia what are you going to do uh here if it arrhythmia it could be a recurrence of previous episode or it could be a arrhythmia which is occurred for the first time with an underlying uh, congenital abnormal heart cardiac abnormality so usually most of the time arrhythmia is a benign in pregnancy but if not no, no. this patient develops arrhythmia and uh, then uh, if they develop arrhythmia first initially reassure the patient call in a specialist start them on anti arrhythmic drugs 
which could be uh, we, can can you use a defibrillator for a pregnant patient we can use a defibrillator so you should use for her a def because she's going for it would be medical management madam if they don't respond to uh, medical management then yes a defibrillator because the amount of uh, electricity which is used will not reach the fetus won't harm it then first would be medical followed by Swati, do you agree with that? Medical followed by defibrillation for an arrhythmia? No, I feel this up first. The defibrillation you have to give, then only. Mm -hmm. And here, remember the defibrillator when we are using, take out the fetal heart monitors. Yes. That we have one. to see whether it is a shockable rhythm or non-shockable rhythm, and depending on that, I think we should yes. go for the defibrillator. No, suppose she is going for a severe VF. Yeah. We have to do something. Otherwise, she is not going to recover from that this thing. So uh, use it. Don't hesitate in using a def defibrillator when the patient is going for a, a severe arrhythmia. And suppose she does not recover, then the recommendation is go for epinephrine and then abiodarin if you need more than two shocks to bring out bring her out of that. Anybody has used an ECMO, Dr. Savita? Any experience with ECMO? No, ma'am. We are not using. Yeah, of course. My husband is physician, and I have intensive care department also there. So, but when. Uh, ECMO require in severe acute respiratory failure, ma'am, with expected mortality because amniotic fluid embolism causes 80% mortality. And if we see there is reversible respiratory failure, we should think for ECMO in prolonged cardiac uh, Swati, uh, Swati, you have used ECMO in CMC? Swati? Yeah, I have used for the same patient which we I discussed okay. amniotic fluid embolism, that okay. one. But it, okay. it didn't work out at all. Okay. Like, yeah, so, we'll work uh, out. Suppose you would have gone earlier, would you have brought her out, ECMO? Uh, yeah, earlier. I don't. Oh, Swati. Might be, because they usually say ECMO for them, if we have revived a little bit, it might be helpful. Helpful. Only for helpful. that patient, only I have used and it didn't work. Great. Other patients, those other three patients you had, amniotic fluid embolism, did you try ECMO there? No, no. No. Okay. Only for one more patient. I am not with fluid embolism, and for that patient, I did a in labor room a perimortem okay. cesarean section for her, okay. through and through done, and the baby also, and both work okay. Very good. So okay. one positive thing that you can one, yeah. you can yeah. recover for, patients from amniotic fluid embolism. Yes. Yeah, like whatever I feel, felt that is amniotic fluid embolism and <laughs> revive yeah. her, and for okay. that patient only, I understood in labor mm -hmm. room we never used to keep the scalpel, okay. so. We should keep a scalpel only we need. We don't need anything else. Yes. Caesar is there. Cot clamp is there. We don't need. Only one vertical incision through and through. through. Just take out the baby. And yes. as soon as the baby is out, and you should not worry like what my PGs, they used to think. Huh. We are we are not able to save the baby. It is not for saving the baby. It is for the mother. Mother, mother. Yes. If yes. they will keep this one in mind, yes. and they should not be hesitant in taking a decision of doing the uh, perimortems, Yes. Uh, cesarean in the labor room. I yes. think we have to prime them. Yes, we are yes. also like, I got very shattered Absolutely. like when I, immediately when I thought I had to do it off. Okay. <laughs> but, but clear, when that, there are clear cut, yeah, yeah. clear cut indications yeah. when they are there, you should proceed. So suppose there's a prolonged cardiac uh, pulmonary, uh, the arrest and the resuscitation has been going for a long time. You cannot do beyond a particular time. It's better to convert to ECMO. That, that's what they say. Yes. And suppose okay. there's a severe ventricular dysfunction, which is refractory to whatever medical management you do, it's better if you go for ECMO as quick as possible. Because I, I think in the Western uh, literature, going for an earlier ECMO saved many patients of amniotic fluid embolism. That's what studies have said. So actually the proposed pathophysiology in this condition is this we need to be very clear because that's how you manage. So it's a disruption of the maternal fetal interface with a potential passage of amniotic fluid into the maternal circulation. But when it, when it enters the circulation, it's going to first cause a pulmonary vasoconstriction and sometimes even a mechanical obstruction of the pulmonary tree. It's going to cause acute right ventricular failure. The heart is going to go for an infarction at the right side. The interventricular septum will be shifted to the left. And by the time there'll be an acute respiratory failure because of the vasoconstriction, the mother is going to go for severe hypoxia. Both are going to contribute to a left, late onset left ventricular failure and that will be with cardiogenic pulmonary edema with a systemic severe hypotension. And by the time the amniotic fluid would have activated the 7A pathway and the platelets, DIC is going to set in. An inflammatory response will further activate the clotting factors. And there will be hemorrhage, which contributes to the hemodynamic instability. This will all lead to a multi-organ failure. So that's why when you're managing an amniotic fluid embolism, always start high quality CPR as quick as possible with cardiac support. Notify a neonatologist, a maternal fetal medicine specialist, 
anesthesiologist and an intensivist and a senior obstetric provider consider immediate delivery if there's a baby is viable either by operative vaginal or emergency cesarean not even in viability if it's more than 24 weeks just take out the baby because that will aid your cpr effects efforts and in the early phase when there's right ventricular failure try to confirm with a bedside transthoracic echocardiography and always avoid excessive fluid resuscitation for this hypotension consider norepinephrine to maintain the blood pressure right ventricular failure can be addressed with inotropes such as dobutamine and milrinone decrease a pulmonary afterload with inhaled nitric oxide or inhaled intravenous or intravenous prostacyclin whenever indicated in the second phase of left ventricular failure and cardiogenic pulmonary edema here also you have to maintain the hemodynamics with the use of norepinephrine and inotropes such as dobutamine or milrinone avoid excessive fluid administration coagulopathy may be immediate or delayed following the collapse of the cardiovascular system activate your massive transfusion protocols wherever available aggressively manage the uterine atony search for anatomic etiologies of bleeding such as pelvic lacerations which may be happening i would like to thank dr rosa ma'am uh, our expert panelists and all the esteemed panelists for a great input and a special thanks to dr surekha and dr reshmi and all the best to dr surekha and these are my references thank you so absolutely much absolutely wonderful madam i must say that we were spell bound and initially we thought my god when we say obstetric collapse and amniotic fluid embolism and uh, the uh, how 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 we are going to face your questions and i think the panelists have done a wonderful job and we were spell bound and i think this is one of the panel where in the recordings will be seen again and again because the type of the details which you have uh, been through and the practical tips and points and i think So really wonderful, Dr. Charmila. I must congratulate you, and I must reiterate that you are and you are really the one uh, to think of when we uh, any any panel for that Thank matter. You. you give justice, and it's like uh, uh, it's it's total. Uh, uh, the teaching is uh, it's a really high quality, and I must congratulate the panelists, all of yeah. you. Please uh, open I, your videos. I really like to see you all of you. Really, they have done really, pra, well, really Pranabika, well. Pranabika, Pranabika, Sangeeta, Swati, Sujay Shri, Dr. Swati, Jaharlal Sir, and uh, uh, we have uh, Sabita. I mean, you are wonderful, and I must see, uh, say that I am going to watch this panel again uh, and again, and I am going to share it with my postgraduates. They have joined, but I think this is one of the panel which is unusual, actually. you know uh, i have seen so many panels but this one is an unusual topic which uh, dr charmila has rightly picked up you know and uh, i think uh, everybody of you deserve a great round of applause from all of us and the participants i second each and every word dr srika has said while the panel was going on we were just chatting chatting how fantastic it is going on it was really so super I I I, I actually have to apologize. I have to apologize to Sangeeta. I stopped her uh, in the middle. I'm sorry for that. No, no, please don't do that. <laughs> I think the cake after two talks was really very wonderful. Thank you. See what happens, you know, Dr. Charmila. We keep on hearing to lot of stall words, but when we go to various parts of the country, we find out. Oh my God, we have such a lot of uh, you know um, talent, faculty, and talents which we should uh, you know keep on uh, uh, picking up. And that is what I think uh, today. I find that I am with so many, so much more knowledgeable people, and that's what is making me awestruck. Oh my God! <laughs> This is how it should be. Thank you, Charmila, thank you. and thank, thank you. you. I think we should thank ourselves also <laughs> that we have chosen such beautiful panelists, and I really, uh, uh, I think it was really wonderful one hour for us. And Both Savita, of us, we were Savita, watching like this. Uh, Savita and me, we meet 